I'm Greg Phillips, editor of Australian Musician Magazine. Welcome to our special tribute to guitar great and founding member of Fleetwood Mac, the enigmatic Peter Green, who sadly passed away on the 25th of July this year. Fittingly, today marks 51 years since the release of Fleetwood Mac's uh, acclaimed third studio album, Then Play On. In this tribute, I chat with artists all over the world who were either influenced by Peter Green or personally knew him. Australian audiences also have the opportunity to win a fabulous Vox Cambridge 50 amp by watching this feature and answering a question which we'll ask a bit later on in the tribute. For now, sit back and enjoy as we remember Peter Green. It would have been the, um, the I suppose, the British blues boom, you know, when, when I was like, 13 or 14 years old you know desperately trying to be a guitar player and then we had this boom over here you know uh, 40 blue fingers and uh you know fleetwood mac and chicken shack uh, you know john mills blues breakers and things um and as as young spotty youths you know with the guitars that's who you can have listened to because up to that point it was always kind of hank marvin or jet harris and tony me and you know very clean twangy guitar sounds and all of a sudden, you started hearing these things that were rocky and bluesy, you know, all featuring guitars. So it would have been John Mills Blues Breakers, uh, first and foremost. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I still, I still play um, the Supernatural in my set uh, now and again today. I'll do a little version of it. So, um, so yeah, that was, that was hideously inspiring. As, yeah. you, as you can imagine, he, hearing a guitar do that, you know, nobody had ever heard a guitar sustain the, the way that did, you know, and it was just, it's such a lovely touch and tone, you know. <laughs> I I didn't, but I, I turned up to do my Thin Lizzy stint with a Yamaha SG2000. And after doing three or four gigs, uh, all of a sudden my guitar wasn't out on stage and there was like the Les Paul Jr. sitting there instead. So I think there was a subtle hint that a you know, rock band should be playing Japanese guitars, <laughs> certainly at that time, uh, you know, late uh, late seventies. So no, I didn't inquire if the, if the guitar was still there. I'd imagine Gary hung on to that as much as long as he could. The one that I use, this this vintage thing, is you know, it's a it's a four hundred pound guitar, and it's obviously been based on Peter's guitar because it has the reverse uh, neck pickup. Uh, so the humbuckers turn the wrong way around, so the screws are further away from the neck. Um, uh, you can put it in and out phase. Uh, I, I think they've just replicated what they could of that particular guitar, and it, it does its job. You know, I mean, a guitar is as famous as, as you know Peter's Les Paul or you know Mick Ronson's Les Paul or whatever should never leave the house. <laughs> you know, do, do not take those things out. It's like running around with a Ming vase under your arm. You know, you just do not do it. Well, the supernatural was a, the first thing that I'd, I'd kind of heard. I mean, that entire album was a, a hard road. There was that collapse, and I can never remember. Um, uh, I, that that would have got me into um, early Fleetwood Mac. So when you hear things like, you know, "Need Your Love So Bad," and then you realise that he wasn't just a great guitar player; he was a great singer. When he did things like "Man of the World" and uh, you know, "Oh Well," uh, they were just brilliant. But I suppose the thing that really got me, like most people, would have been um, Albatross, which was the, you know, the Santo and Johnny sleepwalk, but for a, the next generation. You know, this haunting, ethereal, atmospheric, you know, you know beautiful piece of music uh, just took you away. It was just fantastic. And, and to have an instrumental uh, like that become, you know, a global success was quite something. So that's still a, a fond favourite. I think uh, a wealth of guitar players who were inspired by him, um, you know, uh, a brilliant songwriter, a, a kind of great all-rounder, uh, and, and a, I suppose leaving a, a, you know, a story of the excess of rock, uh, unlike any other band ever. You know, the, the, the trials and tribulations the entire band went through are you know historic um so uh, the good and bad you know it, le it leaves you you know the, the the nuts and bolts of how to write a great song and how to play guitar 
uh, but he also leaves you the warning signs of not, not to do, not to get too involved in the excess uh, because it damages in a big way. Gwyn Ashton and Chris Finnan, welcome to Australian Musician. Thanks for having us. We're talking about Peter Green today. Um, for both of you, when did Peter Green first come across your radar? You first. You first? Oh, okay. Well, okay. Uh, in 1968, so I was uh, 16 years old, and I uh, had bought the Hard Road LP. Um, and so I first heard Peter Green playing that LP, and I was playing in my first band. I got to Australia when I was 14. So the only other real blues I'd heard of English players, but that classic Gibson sound was the, the famous Beano album. And um, straight away, the band I was in, they wanted me to learn some of the songs of the Hard Road album, which I did. But I think the one thing that really blew me away was that beautiful instrumental, The Supernatural. And obviously Peter had developed his sound further uh, when, when Fleetwood Mac came about, but he still had, I was aware that he had to replace Clapton, so it was a, a very similar sound required, but even then, I could, I could, even as a naive teenager, I could hear that he had something that was uniquely his own, and of course that just got stronger and stronger. What about you, Gwen? Um... First time I've discovered Peter Green, uh, I guess because I'm I'm quite a young guy compared to Chris, and uh, it was <laughs> it was I guess mid seventies, um, and I, I was just getting into bands and just starting starting to play, and uh, that that the classic lineup that everybody considers to be you know uh, the Fleetwood Mac lineup with. Stephen X and Lindsay Buckingham was, was just just came on the radio, and I thought, yeah, it's pretty good. And then somebody said to me, "You need to hear Fleetwood Mac with Peter Green." And I went, "Oh, really? Okay." And they they uh, gave me a cassette, and it was like, "Good grief! Why did you change?" <laughs> uh, it was, um, I, I guess that, and then backtracking. Um, it was the Hard Road album um, because I I just got into the the Blues Brokers album, so I, I kind of lived two decades of music in about six months. Um, what did you both like about the way he played? Uh, well, what I liked I, initially, again, I heard him and I just thought it sounded great, and as he's been such a big part of my life, more than. You, you, you take things for granted sometimes, don't you? They're just there. But I think when I, you know, really think, and I thought about it a lot today, was the fact that he wasn't afraid to be himself. And you could always hear, I mean, the obvious things were his wonderful tone or tones, because it was obviously more than one. And when I first heard those things like Love Another Woman, or even when I heard the John Mayall album, Blues from Laurel Canyon, Peter Green played on a track called First Time Alone. And the guitar was miles and miles away and very, very distant and, and very, very spacious. And everybody knows when you play the blues, you've got to leave spaces. But you don't just put spaces anywhere. Every space means so much. So when Peter left the spaces, I could still hear him playing. I could hear him thinking. And, it, and I guess there was a big lesson there about the importance of um, making every note you play mean something. I, I, I was... I suppose, I mean, I never heard Peter as a young man in England or anything, I only heard him on records, but he never wasted any notes. I always felt that every note he played really meant something, and I think that was a big lesson. It was like, you know, if you want to learn, if you want to learn English, you don't buy a dictionary and read it, you, you've got to learn about phrasing and paragraphs and so forth. He just seemed to have this uncanny knack. You could take things from B.B. King or Albert King or whatever, and you could hear them in there. But he, you always heard so much of him. He, I wasn't frightened to be himself. And, and, and that really was a big lesson for me. When you, you were one of the lucky ones who met Peter Green, you supported him. Um, tell me about that experience. Yeah. Um, it was 1996. So I just moved over to England. And somebody said, do you want to play? I was looking for gigs. And uh, somebody said, would you like to play the Padbury 
folk and blues festival or blues and folk or something because this was like a long quarter of a century ago now and uh, I said yeah I'd love to I, I was looking for any gig that I could at the time and I just put a band together and they said well Peter Green's going to be playing I went yeah, yeah I want to be at that and so I was, I was chatting to Peter out the back and uh, the first words he said to me was you look like me when I was young <laughs> <laughs> and uh I, I hadn't that I hadn't even thought about that and and we just got along really well and then we did we did a couple of shows in, in England and I was backstage at a John Mayall gig, uh Blues Breakers, I think he had Buddy Whittington on guitar and Peter Green's Splinter Group was opening the whole tour for them. So I, I just I was invited to go along to the gig and um, I was talking to Peter out the back for quite a long time after the show and he wrote his, his name down on a business card and, and, and his address and he said, come round to the house and, you know, we'll have a cup of tea, you know, we'll, we'll have a play. And then uh, one of the other band members sort of went, Psst, Peter, and he went out and said, oh, I'm not allowed to give you my phone number. <laughs> I mean, oh, okay, that's okay. But I could have gone around his house, but I just didn't want to roll up unannounced, you know. I just thought that would... Yeah, I should have done. That's one of the things I kicked myself for. Peter Green first came across my radar actually to my dad because he's a huge Peter Green fan. So I heard Albatross, um, Fleetwood Mac, of course. Um, my dad had a bunch of VHS recordings of Peter Green and obviously on vinyl too. And um, I just loved his playing, his tone, everything. It was just amazing. Um, you know, he just had that sort of bluesy sort of bass tone, and he really kind of, uh, you know, he, melodically as well. Like the way he played was incredible. So it was like the, the mixture of his tone and, and, and also his choice of notes really affected me. My favorite Peter Green track is called Oh Wow, which is um, a Fitwood Mac track. And uh, yeah, I love that track and Albatross as well. Um, yeah, love them. There we go, there's a bit of uh, Peter Green and Mac, one of my favourite tracks actually. Peter Green's legacy, I mean he was such a mystical guitar player, that's how I like to describe him, real hippie, kind of mystical, very, mis very mysterious guy. Um, his personality, everything, even on stage and the way that he presented himself. But, um, with his playing too, over the years, it really changed a lot from the Fleetwood Mac playing to when he went off to his solo career and everything. Um, yeah, just a really incredible player that, that affected me as a kid. I lived in Wimbledon for some time. South London um, and I met up with a, a bunch of guys they're all into music and one one of them said to me one day hey Pete would you like to play with Peter Green I said wow that would be cool you know this is like maybe early 80s yeah. and he's come up to the pub there's a couple of old pubs up in Wimbledon called the Hand in Hand and the Crooked Billet they're real old places on Wimbledon Common and I met this guy in there and we sat down and I started talking to Peter Green <laughs> and we had a pint of beer and he said I got this deal for 20 grand and I've got the studio in in um, in Streatham in South London and I'm going well this is pretty good There's something not right about this you know and this guy he went to the bar to get everyone another drink and I said to my friend are you sure this is Peter Green because <laughs> he sure doesn't seem and I'd never met him and this friend of mine just says, hey, shush, you know, let's see where this is going. And years later, when I did actually meet Peter and meet the band, these stories were going around about somebody who was nicknamed the Potato Man. Have you ever heard of this? No. Because I'm saying, who's the Potato Man? And they said, oh, he's a guy who used to go around impersonating Peter Green years ago. And I went, I think I met him. <laughs> but it was 19... 97 i think when i first met peter and in, in person you know and um 
So Neil Murray, the bass player, had called me up. Neil was in the first lineup of the Splinter Group with, uh, of course, the great Cozy Powell on drums as well and Spike Edney on keyboards. And um, Neil said he was going to move on to work with Brian May. And he said, so, you know, the, the bass chair is there if you, if you like. And I said, that'd be great. I'd love to do that. So I, I met up with them around 97. I might've gone to, a, I did go to a local um, concert to check it all out. And it was a great blue set. Um, and when I joined up, that's what we were doing. Mostly the you know, Otis Rush and all these things and some of Peter's old stuff. So I think I did the first gig with them at maybe 98, 1998. And then it all started ramping up the band uh, actually came together and that same band worked for the next maybe six, five to six years. Yeah. What do you remember about the first gig? The first gig I remember well was the um, Belgium Jazz Blues Festival. Taj Mahal was, was uh, I got to meet Taj, you know, and uh, we were on just before him. Um, that was a, um, a big uh, marquee quite a few thousand people in there, not a couple, you know, more like 10 to 15. Um, and it was a bit touch and go because we'd had a rehearsal without the keyboard player. They had a different drummer sitting in and I was sort of like depping at the time because I'd never played with them. And we went across and, and played, it's probably an hour and a quarter set as, as per usual for these things. Um, but I just enjoyed it. You know, I just enjoyed that music and hearing him play. How was he as a as a band leader? Uh, I mean, you you wrote some songs for some of the recordings for Splinter Group. How how was he yeah. in regard to involving other members of the band? Um, he was he was a quiet leader. He, you know, I've worked with some people who are, are loud and and therefore not as efficient as they they could be. Um, um, Peter was fairly quiet. He went along with most things. Uh, if he didn't like something, if he if he said no, it's not going to work, then that was it. It was fine. But he he tried everything that we played, and I mean, it was a joy to for any of us, I think, to walk in and say, "Would you mind trying this song?" And he would sit, and particularly one of my songs, he sat one day with the lyrics, and he he said, "Come here, come here." <laughs> What, what, what does this line mean here? And I said, well, if you go down a bit further, Pete, the rhyming of it, there's the explanation underneath there. And he go, oh, great, great. Okay, I got it. Now, when you're writing a song, uh, you, you've got a particular, in your head, a, a melody maybe for the, for the words and everything. And this is your guide. This is your guide principle for the melody. And... I just don't know how he did it, but he would be able to completely change that and phrase it in such a way, I think, I never thought of that. You know, I never thought of that phrasing. He would make things late. He would introduce the words earlier. He had his own way of, of doing those sorts of things. And uh, it's particularly interesting, uh, his guitar playing was like that as well. I think his timing was his own thing. Yeah. What was it like as a musician uh, playing bass with uh, Peter Green? Um, I mean, you, you probably played with numerous guitar players. Um, experience of playing in a band with Peter Green, the guitarist. Peter Green, the guitarist, it, it, it was fabulous. He, he sometimes needed a little bit of a push on stage, um, especially in the earlier days because he wasn't... Um, as energetic <laughs> as he as he became, um, and it was it was always a thrill. And of course, when you heard some of the flourishes that came out, it, it was just you know it was really joyful. It was really joyful. And in the studio, I mean, the studio sometimes when he was just running through things, he'd play something. You go, wow, where did that come from? You know, he did. Well, I think one night in the studio, it was late night. He was he was said he wanted to fiddle around with some soloing work in a song and he did something and I went oh my god he said what I said I said you know Phil Upchurch the, the jazz guitar player and he yeah yeah I said that was just him 
that was what you did, you know. It, it just came out. He never did it again, mind. <laughs> when you look back at your time in the Splinter Group, what are the memories that are strongest for you? Um, I, I think the amount of work we did uh, is a good memory. We did a lot of touring, especially in England, which and we were pulling back from that a little bit because you can saturate your own country. But a lot of the gigs are real good fun. Some were hard work and some of the travel, of course, um, was very hard work. We were recording, I think it was Destiny Road in London and the managers decided we could go to Japan one weekend and do four gigs and then come back on Monday and start recording again. Um, and there were some great festivals that we did. Um, Pistoia in Italy is a wonderful festival to play at. Yeah, so there were, there were a lot of lot of good gigs that we did, you know. There's a clip of the Splinter Group playing with uh, Carlos Santana on Black Magic Woman. Um, was that, yes. Was that the kind of event that Peter enjoyed? It was an event that I enjoyed. <laughs> that, that was a wonderful night. Um, the club in San Francisco. Uh, name escapes me right here. Yes, I think he did. Uh, I think he did, you know, various people got up and played with his um, Papa Chubby one night. And I think Hubert Sumlin got up yeah, when we were playing in Switzerland. I don't think he minded at all, but he would quite often take the back seat. And invariably in these situations, you get the guitar players invited a friend up and they'll spar with each other. But Peter would, he would just lay back a little bit and go, well, this guy's coming up. People want to see him playing now. Uh, and and then you know you'd look at him and go, come on Pete, it's your turn now, and he'd move forward and play. But that was lovely because Carlos is such a um, a kind spirit of a man, and he actually said some really nice words about Peter for three or four minutes before we played, and did the song with us, and then said thank you very much, and and walked off. It was a great pleasure to meet him. I mean, always a hero from to me and many musicians of my ilk, you know. Yeah. Um, Peter obviously had his ups and downs. He had um, mental health issues. Um, when he was uh, not having such a great day, was he the kind of guy that you could comfort and encourage or did he more sort of retreat? Um, I tell you what, you know, I didn't live too far away from him. Um, in those days and I would occasionally go around and pick him up and we'd go out for the day to a guitar shop guitar village in Farnham or uh, sh uh, more local shops to me he liked going into places that sold percussion instruments and um, you know African stuff and all that so he, he was pretty okay in, in the early days I met him he was a bit quiet um, I think the the um, pharmaceutical drugs you know the doctors drugs that he'd been taken they were gradually cutting them back because they did make him a bit tired and that and he was pretty up for every anything if we were going on tour we'd have a meeting and to discuss the tour and where it was going what we needed to do and he would always be asked you know are you looking forward to this and he'd go, oh yeah yeah it'd be great you know do some traveling and all that so you all seem to be up for stuff yeah tell me about the breakup of the band how did that happen and how did you feel about the end of the band well I was really annoyed with it because the following year I'd been chatting with our tour manager who, who handled a lot of the booking, Arthur Anderson. And he said to me, Pete, next year's looking really busy and we haven't even looked for work. This was all coming off the back of the albums. You know, the more albums you do, people say, yeah, Peter Green, yeah, he's serious. He's, 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 they're keeping going, you know. And um, we had a lot of good work coming in. So it was going to be easier to do the work because we didn't have to chase it. And of course, in those, in those days, we weren't earning um, great money on the tours. It was a good livable wage. but So this work looked better and it suddenly stopped. And yeah, I was annoyed about it. I never got to the bottom of it all, but I think um, there was a public notice put out that uh, Nigel Watson wasn't allowed to be in touch with Peter Green anymore and the rest of us just stood back you know and said nothing to do with us well Larry Tolfrey and myself and Roger Cotton 
so there was there was something going on in the background peter was um um a client of the public is it called public guardianship office i think it was called um and they just take care of people's estates and their money and everything so he was protected so obviously something's gone on in there that uh, I know bits about, but I, it wouldn't be right for me to, to say in case, I don't think there'd be any legal problem with it, but I might have a fact or two a little bit wrong, you know. But it was a shame because I thought Peter was getting to that point and I'd hoped when the band split anyway that he would, he stopped playing for a few years, didn't he? About three or four years and then he went out with a, another band. And I think me and everybody was waiting for him to come out with that album where you thought, there he is. He's he's back to that point again in time. Yeah. Well, what was the last gig you played with him? The last gig, man, you're stirring up some memories here. It was uh, on the Isle of Wight um, at the Medina Medina Theatre on the Isle of Wight, which is part of a college campus, um, and that was an extra gig tagged on to the end of a six week UK tour that we done. So that was the last one. And I literally, last time I saw him was standing on the docks at Southampton, <laughs> as the Beatles saying, you know, because uh, he drove off and the next couple of days later, he was in Sweden. Peter Green, the original uh, Fleetwood Mac guitarist uh, passed away on the weekend. Is that a guitarist that you've come across at all in your you travels? Know, I was pretty late to the Peter Green um, party. Um, it's Kenny, my guitarist, was the one who introduced me to Peter Green. And, um, and, and I'm embarrassed to say that because I played with Fleetwood Mac um, in, um, in the very early 90s. Um, and uh, I just didn't realise until much later how filthy blues they were. And... Um, you know, just it it really blew me away, particularly over the yeah the last ten years. I was introduced to his work, and um, I mean, we do one of the songs we do on stage where Kenny, I hand the mic over to Kenny, his heartbeat like a hammer, um, which is yeah just sensational. I mean, that Texas shuffle that uh, Mick Fleetwood does is just <laughs> so good. So yeah, it was very very sad news. I remember when I was fairly young, like 15 or 16, kind of right around the time <clears throat> I was getting very into blues, like, you know, first finding B.B. King's music and John Lee Hooker and all those people. Um, I had a, a magazine, which was the Blues magazine, that had Eric Clapton on the front. And initially it was, you know, I was just obsessed with Eric Clapton, wanting to know everything about him I could. And in that article, there was a, in that magazine, there was an article about Fleetwood Mac. Um, Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac and like most people I think the only Fleetwood Mac I knew was like Don't Stop or maybe Rhiannon or something like that so it was really confusing for me reading about that they were a blues band to start off with and I think funnily enough it was kind of like because they there were photos of them as these kind of pale skinny curly haired long haired dudes I kind of saw a bit of myself looking at that. So I think that's kind of what piqued my interest at first. And then I listened to it and I really loved it. But I think the first kind of stuff I heard was obviously like Shaking Moneymaker and maybe more the kind of Jeremy Spencer type songs. And then it wasn't really until maybe like 2014 or 13 that I just, I went deeper in on the Fleetwood Mac stuff and really deep on the Peter Green stuff hearing World Keep On Turning and Albatross and Oh Well. And that was like, it just became an obsession, like really at that time. And that was like, I feel like so much of my Peter Green influence happened at that, those kind of years. What was it that you liked about his playing and, and his tone? Yeah, I think definitely playing wise for me, I've always been way more interested in guitarists that are, more about feeling and having like a lyrical quality to their playing than you know speed and pyrotechnics all that stuff doesn't really interest me but his playing was just it was so beautiful and lyrical and and slow that i i really liked slow players like bb king and you know eric clapton and peter green is like a master of that sound and 
the fact that he he really used a lot of reverb, I really found that really haunting and and his voice as well, I think. Um, for me, it was like, you know, it took me a while to kind of find what my thing would be seeing blues influence music. And I knew I could never sing like Howlin' Wolf or Muddy Waters or something like that. But Peter Green's voice, there was something about the tone of his voice and the quality. He, he was a full package, you know, singer, songwriter and guitarist and just kind of the pinnacle of all three. So I've covered so many of his songs live now. I've done We'll Keep On Turning and Albatross I do all the time and even Jumping at Shadows, which is like a great, he did a cover version of that. But that's a really great song. And there's an Otis Rush song called Homework that they did a lot that I've done that. So I think more than any other artist's music, I've covered so much Peter Green Fleetwood Mac music just because I feel that I can, you know, I feel comfortable doing it. Like I can pay tribute to it. And yeah, it's always, it's amazing how many people know that music and just respond to it. Yeah. Did you get to see him play at all? I did. Yeah. I saw him at Blues Fest. I can't, I can't quite remember what year it was. Um, 2010 maybe. Yeah. I think something like that. So it must've been, I think I was just out of school and I got to see him and I, I went kind of like right up the front, got there really early because I was really excited and I, I loved it. I, I know a lot of people were kind of disappointed that he wasn't doing like the fiery, you know, wasn't playing like it was 1969 or whatever, but I always seeing those type of people just in the flesh always for me was enough. And I think he played really beautifully. I remember him doing Albatross and it just being really tasteful and beautiful. And yeah, just, it was just, I'm really glad I got to, at least seen live once. What would you say Peter Green's legacy is? Yeah, I think it's, I think as a singer, songwriter and guitarist, I think he's at the top. You know, I think he's the top of all those British guitarists. I love Eric Clapton. I love Mick Taylor. And they're obviously all joined together from the John Mayall blues breakers. But I think Peter Green is just the pinnacle of that music. And he played it, he played it so authentically but also what I was drawn to was he had such an open mind to the blues where if you listen to the first Fleetwood Mac album and then you listen to them play on, they kind of stretched that so far. And it was what started out as maybe just an authentic blues band went off and did so many things with the genre and took it further, which for me, I think that's a testament to any artist is that you can kind of, you know, be a mixture of all your influences, but take it further and do something unique. And he definitely did that. And I mean, you can see the effect that Fleetwood Mac had on Led Zeppelin and, and all that type of what became blues rock, like even now the Black Keys or Jack White or anything, you can kind of find traces of the DNA of that music. In the process of putting together this tribute, we reached out to musicians all around the world. Uh, not all got back to us and some just couldn't contribute. One of those that we did uh, reach out to was Peter's uh, former Fleetwood Mac bandmate, Jeremy Spencer. Uh, Jeremy politely declined to uh, be involved on camera, but did kindly pass on this message. Hearing of Peter's passing on made me recall my last conversation with him in March this year. It was, as other calls over the years, pleasant communication covering different topics. I believe he is finding the peace now that was forfeited in him here. I owe him a lot, teaching me the importance of emotion and less is more in music. In the words of Shakespeare, if music be the food of love, then play on. So then, Peter, till we meet again, play on. Australian audiences have the opportunity to win a Vox Cambridge 50 amp. To enter, simply tell us via email what colour was Peter's Manalishi. Next up, one of the more interesting feature interviews we did for this tribute, and that was with former Fleetwood Mac manager Dennis Dunstan. Uh, Dennis reveals some never-before-heard stories of Peter Green. So sit back and enjoy. Mick Fleetwood recently uh, told Rolling Stone at the start of the year that he really wanted people to know that Peter Green started the band. It, it, it wasn't Mick. It, it was Peter's band. Um, oh, yes. 
you, you spent a lot of time with the band sitting around hotel rooms, backstage, buses, planes. Within the band, how was Peter Green remembered? He was always regarded in the highest respect, um, legendary status really amongst the band. And everyone was aware that it was Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac. But it's his uh, selflessness and his lack of ego that wanted, he knew that at one point he would leave. And he always knew that deep down. Mick and I have talked about this, you know, in depth. And it was almost the legacy that he was leaving. The band will be called Fleetwood Mac. So he never adapted. It was, the band was called Fleetwood Mac, but the press took it up as Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac. And um, so, yes, early, early, early incarnations of Fleetwood Mac, even with you know, Bob Welsh and Danny Curl and, and, you know, all of the, all the other guys, they, they all, all absolutely adored Peter Green. And, and I, I think this, they were in awe of him. I mean, no one, I mean, the licks that he, he played and he created, you know, from Green Man Alicia to Oh Well to, you know, Albatross has always been Fleetwood Mac's closing song. Not that they played, but as the crowds, ever since I was involved in from 70, 78 onwards, when the crowds are leaving at the end of the show, Albatross comes on. And I think that says, uh, speaks volumes about Pete's um, contribution, beyond the contribution. It was, he's in indelible mark that has, and it's sort of lovely to, to see now because it doesn't annoy me, but, I, I always hear, oh, it's not the same without Lindsay. It's not the same without Lindsay. But I always said there would be no Lindsay without Peter Green. Mm. So I have to remind people or educate them. Sometimes it exhausts me. And I only tell that story to people I feel like I that will listen and care about it. But, you know, people who are who in, involved with it, who, who just love the Stevie and Lindsay period, that's all great and that's fabulous. And they did do, make an amazing contribution. And Lindsay is a friend of mine and did amazing things for the band. But... He, he basically took, he didn't take over, he just continued the legacy that, that Peter Green had left Mick and John to proceed with for as many years as they wanted to. Yeah. Tell me about your personal uh, dealings with Peter. Well, it was um, <clears throat> in the early 80s, Mick and I, uh, after a London Wembley show, had decided to track Pete down and to say hello and check on his well-being and, you know, what he was up to. And we were honoured to invite him to the show. We even wanted to have him get up and, and play if he was capable, but we just weren't sure, Greg. So we found out through a lot of hard work, we finally got an address um, in East London somewhere. I, I forget exactly where we went now, um, but... Hampstead Heath, if I remember, I can't remember, but um, we finally found this little terrace house, typical of a Melbourne, long, narrow, Victorian and um, single story. And we, we knocked on the door and um, you could hear these feet coming up the hallway and, and then, the, you know, the door opening. And it wasn't Pete, it was Pete's brother. And um, he immediately recognised Mick. Oh, hello, Mick, you know, how's, how's it going, mate, you know, and, he says, oh, hello. And, and, uh, and he says, oh, I'm calling to see if Pete's home. He said, yeah, um, you, know, you want to talk to him now, do you? I said, well, yeah, <laughs> that's why we're here. We'd like to say hello and see how he's doing. And, and um, so next minute, we were still left standing at the door. <laughs> and uh, he got, because the brother was becoming overprotective of Pete. And um, he, he went back down the hallway. And remember those long, narrow halls in the kitchen was always at the back. And then, then this 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 gentleman got up and started coming down the hallway, and his hair was down to around his waist, and um, and he had an old one of those red checkered um, dressing gowns on, and the red cord wrapped around it, and a pair of old slippers, and he comes to the door and he scratching his head, and then we realised his fingernails were about ten inches long, wow. and it was. It's penance to himself, so he didn't have to play guitar. Wow! And um, and didn't want to play guitar, and was um pretty complex and pretty set us back a little bit. And um, we could see that they were struggling financially, and so we did get invited in. We had a cup of tea, and we sat there, but it was emotionally draining. And about an hour later, we left, and of course, Mick, you don't even say we want to get up and play guitar because we knew, you know. 
the guitar wasn't even sitting in the corner. We didn't even see anything to do with any instrumentation, nothing anywhere. And here he's in his, you know, sitting in his old chair. And, you know, I felt like I was going to visit my grandfather who was an old person's home. That's what it felt like, you know. And the guy was in his, you know, 50s, in his late 40s. So we are, um, cut a long story short, we, um, yeah, he was actually longer, younger than that. He was in his early 40s, late 30s. So um, we... We then um, left, you know, Mick was crying in the cab or in the limo, <laughs> it wasn't a cab, it was a limo. And we went heading back to our hotel. And, um, and I said, Mick, we got to do something. And we got to, and he says, if you can do something, dude, we can find out. Cause none of his money, he wasn't receiving any royalties. And, um, and then, so the investigation work started and um, I discovered through the publishing company um, that all of his money was going to the children of God, the religious cult that was at California based uh, in Arizona as well. They had a number of camps and that's where Peter had disappeared to in mid seventies. And when the early Phil Mac, I think it was 73, 74. And uh, they were, they were touring as, as Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac and doing quite well. And they got up one day and Peter was gone, never to be seen again. And he'd, he'd gone off to join the children of God. That was the end of his life in Fleetwood Mac and, and basically the end of his life in the music industry. And he was, you know, sometimes you think, oh, he'd disappear for six or 12 months. But that wasn't the case for him. That was the end. And, and then Mick had to sort of basically think about how, what he was going to do and what they were going to do. So they all went back to England, then regrouped. But that's a story for another day. But getting back to Pete. So now they had somehow coerced him to sign him an agreement that all of his publishing royalties would go to them. Mm. And um, so, yes, this lovely religious uh, sect of people um, doing all the right things and getting someone who was basically addicted to acid or drugs or balls like Shapiro. I said to Mickey, we've got to try and get these royalties back, uh, at least some of it, and make sure all of the future ongoing royalties um, would would be channeled because imagine airplay is still all of that all of the airplay the sales of all the Fleetwood Mac records was for anything to do with Peter Green and his share which he did write most of, most of the big hits of the early Fleetwood Mac days and um, but of course the airplay on on those tracks was continues continues to this day to be of a high volume but uh, come mid eighties. Um, we tracked down and we, our lawyers got involved. Uh, we sued them, settled out of court. They signed back all the royalties to Pete. And, um, and then basically we got a million dollars back for him. About a, it was about a million three hundred. And at that stage, which was quite a lot of money back, we still know that there was probably another two or three million missing. But I guess at some point you go, well, at least we've got some back. and There's no way they were ever going to re receive another cent from that point on. And um, uh, and we were fortunate enough to to win that case, and that's why I have no no um, no qualms about mentioning the children of God and those those, those uh, disgusting cults that think they, they disguise themselves as this nice religious you know um, corporation or whatever they are. But anyway, um, they were happy stealing his money, and, and we were very happy taking it back off them. And uh, so. <clears throat> We, uh, we rolled up to Pete's door. 12 months later, we flew into London and knocked on the door. And um, we had a letter um, uh, basically directing him uh, to, to a, a bank account where the money had been deposited for him. And um, we said, the money's there. And then, uh, obviously, we just had to hope because he'd signed over his power of attorney to his brother. So then we knew that there was sort of a situation there. So we put some of it. We, we, we were basically, we, we tried to advise him to put some of it into a trust that couldn't be touched. So it could only be used by Pete and, you know, and then, so we did find out that uh, his brother was getting into it quite a bit and, and, and doing some, so, but, but we did clear that matter up as well. And we threatened to sue his brother if that, if that didn't stop happening. And um, so that's, that, all that stuff was done because Mick, um, you know, and, and myself, we wanted to make sure that he was taken care of as he was so, so well deserved to be for the rest of his life. Yeah. And at least he died, you know, in comfortable surroundings.
Yeah. Even uh, I, I've seen, either, I'm not sure if it was on YouTube or I read it, that uh, even in the early days, he, he didn't really care about the royalties. He wanted to give it away to people he it, thought deserved it more. He, he, yeah, he probably would have given it. And look, we don't even know now whether he did give a lot of that fortune away that, and, and the ongoing royalties that were going into that new, you know, that new account that was created for him and what he did with it. We, I guess we won't know that because once you've given the money and he's got control of it or whoever is involved, but um, we knew that he was in least decent surroundings and we knew that we'd done the right thing. And, um, you know, we were all, we were happy about that. Um, but yes, he, he always had no ego at all, Greg. He's never had any ego. He was just a pure genius who was happy. I remember the last show, a friend of mine, George Purvins, who lives in Melbourne, is a real guitar freak, and he one of his last shows ever in Australia, and Pete sat when he was playing, this is only a number of years ago, I think in the last six or seven years, and he sat with his back to the audience mm. on a chair. And there were just glimpses of his former brilliance. Not really, Greg, sadly, because um, she would have loved it, but he would never have got up in a huge crowd like that, which was always would have been the case. Um, it was just something we all wanted it to happen, and that's why we went to invite him to play, but it was the nails, and then, of course, his, his uh, mental health condition from all of the early acid and, and, and pills, and he wasn't in, you know, and um, if... If you probably said to him, Stevie Nicks, he'd probably say, who? Yeah. That's how, how distanced he'd become from anything to do. Readings, he wouldn't read anything about the pop world or what was going on. Uh, Stevie did want that, though. She did always want it. Uh, we wished it had have happened for her and for Mick and for John and for Christine. Uh, and, you know, it would have been fabulous. But um, the closest they ever got was everyone has always played Black Magic Woman, or black, especially Oh Well, Lindsay loved Oh Well. And of course, with the last Mike Campbell and Neil Finn, this last incarnation, which I think is, I'd like to put on record now, which I think is another pure Mick Fleetwood genius, mm. getting those two guys, both humble, amazing musicians who absolutely looked up to Peter's work immensely and were heavily influenced by Peter Green in their own guitar playing and their own singing styles. I mean, I, I think it can never be understated just how important Peter Green is to the music industry. And when Eric Clapton, you know, when he replaced Eric Clapton in the, in the Blues Breakers, you know, and people were writing, and, and to replace Eric Clapton, and then to have the subway written, Clapton is dead, spray painted or painted on walls of subways throughout London, Peter Green was the greatest. He he, he was the greatest guitar player and, and I told him so and he would always just laugh and go, no, nah, you know, and, but there's no question that the, the greats of the world who do know guitarists and guitar playing are humbled by the incredible virtuosity of Peter Green. Yeah. Um, of all the uh, guitarists that have played in Fleetwood Mac, who was uh, the most uh, reverential of Peter's playing? Who, who wanted more songs in the, more Peter Green songs in the set list? Wow, that's interesting. Um, I would have to probably say Rick Vita when they're using that short stint um, with, with Billy Burnett. Uh, Rick, amazing guitar player. In fact, did the Peter Green tribute in February in London and the Hammersmith just recently, this year. How ironic was that? And uh, Rick was invited and he was basically the musical director. And it was Rick that worked because Mick, we had Rick uh, Vito in Mick Fleetwood Zoo, you know, which was a touring sort of when Mick wasn't playing with Fleetwood Mac, that was his fun band, and we'd go out and do pub and club gigs. And uh, even up until recently, Rick, you know, um, wasn't sadly invited to, to join the Fleetwood Mac lineup. I, he was always better in that blues sort of um, Mick Fleetwood's blues band situation. Um, and um, but Mick, when Mick invited him, to play and be the, the, the guitar player, the lead guitar player amongst some of the greats on that stage that you'll be hearing about because it was all filmed by a German TV station yeah. and that's going to come out next year sometime. And um, it is absolutely brilliant. But Rick Vito was absolutely honoured um, to, to do that. And I've got to say, Lindsay did love it. Lindsay, we, we played obviously Oh Well, but um, 
I, I'd also have to say Neil Finn and Mike Campbell, the most recent, they insisted, and Stevie and Christine and Mick and John all wanted much more of the early Fleetwood Mac bought set, bought into the new set of this last, <coughs> excuse me, of this last tour. And there was a lot more um, Peter Green stuff. And it was just brilliant when it was played. Yeah. And those guys did a true justice. Yeah. Did, it was um, fantastic. Did Mick and, and John sitting around backstage talk much about the old days? Weirdly enough, backstage, there's not a lot of social activity going on between the band. In fact, they, they all have their own separate dressing rooms. It's not like, you know, um, uh, so it's, yeah, I mean, it was well known that they, you know, for a while there in the mid to late 80s, I had five limos and, and even at one point when our one jet broke down, we had five Lear jets and, um, and you know, well, there's actually six, one for each band member and there was a limo for me, which is great. That, um, yeah, and then we even went through a point where there was separate hotel rooms between Lindsay and Stevie, you know, separate hotels, not hotel rooms, so different hotels. And it got that bad for a while, but they understood the business, which was Fleetwood Mac. And when they got on that stage for that two or three hours, nobody knew any different. When they came off, see you later. And went. But Mick and John have always had an undying respect for each other and a brotherhood that will never be uh, denied. They love each other. They've had their mind a little... Um, mine a little, uh, you know, shortfalls, but really very, you know, nothing major at all. You know, they, they just respect each other. And I think, you know, um, to this very day, if it wasn't, if John and Mick are not in the band, I think this, um, it's the end of Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. So how did you hear about Peter Green's passing? I got an email. Um, first thing in the morning early on um early this week um uh, when was it on um yeah so, yeah i forget the day now it's been a pretty emotional last few days and um and then i got a a, a call it was from melbourne it was my good friend george he said he said d have you heard i said no it was about eight o'clock and he says peter green just died and then i got straight on the phone to mick because it was late afternoon in hawaii where mick lives in maui and um he says, I was just about to call you. And um, we had a good cry together. And so we were, to, uh, you know, trying to reminisce and, and, um, together about, you know, how important and what, what, and what a loss to the industry. It's 73. It's young, you know. And Mick's 73 now. And, um, so, you know, and Chris is 60, 76 and that. But, you know, they're all still plugging along. And here's Pete. It's obviously it was that early abuse. Um, and I, I jokingly, and Mick and I had a, a laugh between our tears, basically saying, that, he says, and look at the abuse I did to myself and I'm still here. He says, you know, <laughs> but um, I said, mate, it's, it's a wonder you're still here. <laughs> the amount of uh, cocaine that went up that nose and brandy that went down his throat. But uh, you know what? He's as strong as a horse and, and Chris is, is, they're all clean and healthy now and they have health instructors on the road with them and dieticians and it's like they're 17 again we might get another five tours out who knows <laughs> Discovering Peter Green uh, for me was probably a very convoluted story and that's probably not uncommon for musicians of my generation. Uh, I grew up playing the live scene and cutting my teeth from the early 80s onwards. Not a very cool time in music really. But uh, so all those uh, great records that were made in the 60s and the 70s for that matter were not reissued yet and and you really uh, didn't have the internet or, or the information access that you do now, of course. You couldn't just, you know, type in Hard Road or, you know, the Blues Breakers or early Fleetwood Mac. It just, it just wasn't, just didn't happen that way. So uh, you really needed access to somebody who had a great record collection or, or um, you know, we had an import record shop uh, locally where a lot of this stuff would live. And we would hang out there and 
you know, we just listened to records being played all day. And, um, and I also think that's why music shops in those days were a hub of activity because uh, we were hungry for information and we could only learn what we could learn from maybe older musicians or other customers, people who worked in the shops. It was, it was kind of a slightly different scene, it, it, to my mind anyway. So um, it, it, somewhere in the early mid 80s, 84, 85, somebody gave me a cassette of the first John Mayall, Blue, the, the Beano album. And uh, for me, that was, an, that was a, a critical moment in my development because I was listening to a range of different things, you know, everything from Frank Zappa to Steve Ray Vaughan was actually on the scene at that, at that time. And, uh, but here was uh, what was, seemed like an old recording uh, of a blues band uh, with a vocalist, especially John Mayall's vocals. It didn't sound like B.B. King. And, and you know, uh, that was a big thing for me because uh, I, was, I sounded like a white boy, you know, singing blues, especially when I was younger. And to hear that it was a it was possible to do it without having the the vocal tone of John Lee Hooker or BB or one of these great you know musicians was a revelation and 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 so we you know me and my immediate group of friends you know we, we played that album you know to death basically um, so but here's where it gets tricky uh, when the second album came along I, I I can't remember if I got it at the same time or or shortly after because there was a second album did you know there's a second album you know somebody in a music shop but um, you know, cassettes were currency uh, for, for my generation and people would make you a copy of, of their cassette. So uh, I got the Hard Road album on a cassette uh, and of course there was no text on that, there was no, uh, no information. And as far as I was concerned, I didn't know that there was a different guitar player in the band. I could hear it sounded different, but uh, I just thought there was an evolution happening. I was like, oh wow, you know, like now listen to this, you know, it was like an, another, another step. And um, in actual fact, I think that uh, once I discovered that there was a new guitar player in the band through conversations with older musicians, uh, I got a compilation cassette of somebody, which was a whole bunch of Peter Green's recordings. And that would have been even a couple of things from Hard Road uh, to the early Fleetwood Mac uh, couple of albums. And there was absolutely no context once again, and there was no uh, timeline on any, on any of this stuff. Um, so for me, it was just, it was, I was hit with the best of straight away. Uh, so this is, I don't know, this, this is 86, say. And, um, uh, but I was, I was so, I just loved what I could hear and, and you know, I, I love what I was hearing. Uh, and my early influences were guys like Les Paul, who played with this kind of obviously jazzy, clean sound. And and although I loved all the rock players, I, I really loved all the rock players. So that was what I wanted to do. Um, Green's approach, especially when you think about um, when he came on uh, to do Hard Road and, and stepping in the shoes of Eric Clapton, you know, uh, what he was doing was he was achieving sustain to my ears by using the reverb. And uh, and obviously had the amps cranked, but he wasn't going for this dirty sound. It was kind of like this this reverb soaked sound to get those long notes and stuff. And I, I really loved, you know, what Peter was writing, and, uh, and it, it fit in perfectly with where I was at the time because I, in in my early days, I was listening to sort of jazzy fusiony stuff, and uh, I thought it was, you know, you had to aim high, you had to sort of be clever to to be different. And uh, I guess that's the folly of being really young and not understanding the emotion of music too. But, you know, uh, uh, so I loved the Zappa stuff and all, all of that. And then, um, but when I heard, uh, even uh, oh, oh Well, you know, it's got like the, those several parts at the start before it gets into the groove. And, you know, like there's like one, two, three, like the first, dun, 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 and all that stuff. But what I really love is that line, you know, dun, 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 dun. and it, to me, it sounded like a jazz line because it wasn't constructed evenly. It kind of finishes on a, on a, on a five kind of feel, you know, dun, 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 like there's extra. Anyway, but, um, uh, you know, to me, that was so great. It was, it was kind of in this grooving, bluesy, rock feel to me but it had these kind of jazzy elements played by these you know hard guitars and you know uh, I, I think that uh, you know Danny Kerwin and, and Jeremy Spencer you know they they were the unsung heroes of the band too because you know Danny plays a lot of that lead stuff when it, when the rhythm takes off and uh, 
and uh, you know there was just the three guitar attack it was just some amazing thing <laughs> Shape I'm in, I can't sing, I am pretty, and my legs are thin. But turn out to what I think of you, I might not give you the answer that you want me to. I think the first time uh, I heard him do uh, things like the Supernatural, Albatross for that matter, but the Supernatural obviously uh, had that long, you know, ghost uh, sustain. And you could really hear that it needed that, the, the verb to make that happen. I don't know if they did that in the studio or if they did it through an amp, but to achieve that kind of thing as a, a kid with playing through my dad's Fender amp and, uh, you know, we cracked the reverb and tried to make those sounds. Um, so there was a lot we didn't know uh, about how they were achieving these tones and sounds, but it was like a miracle really to listen to, uh, to those naive ears. And uh, guitar players I would go and see, Kevin Boric, the Emmanuel Brothers, people like this, you know, uh, they were playing the scene, and I would see the Emmanuels quite a lot. And I know that Phil used to love to play Albatross, and that's probably where I first heard somebody play that stuff. And uh, uh, you know, it even it was even a surprise to me to discover that those harmony lines, bow, 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 it was actually two people, you know. So um, you know, there were three guitar players in in, in that band uh, in the first Fleetwood Mac lineup, and. Uh, so all of this stuff was was information that was gathered over a, a period of time. So there was a, a real fascination to it because it was like a plot unfolding, uh, you know, in those days. I mean, I'm forever saying to students, you've got no idea how lucky. I'll be giving a lesson and I'll just say, oh, have you heard, ever heard uh, the Supernatural, you know, YouTube, boom, I just type it in and there it is. But uh, my first uh, tape of that stuff that I'm referring to, you know, was this muddy setting a set we had to crank some top end into it to make it sound okay because it was a it was probably a tape of a tape of a tape and because i didn't get all this music in some chronological order uh, i just got it all kind of at once really in the mid 80s uh you know it was i just thought it was a great variety of, of sounds you know because you, you you put oh well uh next to man of the world next to green man alicia it's you know they're they're amazingly different even though they're connected but and Green Man Alicia was, uh, was another thing because uh, it was so dramatic, you know. I, I didn't know it was the last single that the, the band were going to record or anything like that. It was just another song to me. But to me, uh, you know, it was almost like where I wanted to go. I, I had a band called The Astros at the time and, you know, I was trying to attempting to write songs in sections and parts as opposed to as a, a verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle, late, out kind of experience. And, you know, the drama of Green Man Alicia uh, uh, really knocked me out you know and, and I can see it with that driving dun, 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 that sort of thing that it had that um I can see well I think Judas Priest did a cover of it all some heavy band did a cover I actually don't think I've heard it but anyway um but you know I, I can understand why people from that ilk went for it because it was sort of that down you know that eighth note kind of downbeat thing <laughs> understand Peter's story a little bit better as the years went on uh, you could hear probably in the context of that song uh, that he was a troubled soul you know and uh, and this is the great shame of Peter's story um, because once again I'm, I'm out of school talking about it but because I'm an observer of the story but it seems to be that uh, somewhere around the end of Fleetwood Mac uh, I mean, I, 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 Mick Fleetwood, is, I've seen him on a documentary talking about this and he talks about being in Germany, I think, and, and, and Peter going off with a couple of German people and uh, who were obviously ravers or I think he refers to them as some cult people. And, you know, Peter was getting into acid and LSD and all that kind of stuff and, and trying to be creative uh, while under that influence from what I understand. But unfortunately, uh, many people will know that you know, messing around with that kind of, those substances, there's those that will just never come back. And, um, you know, it's it's a terrible shame to think that uh, a, a, such a talent as Peter Green, who was messing around with all that stuff, 
uh, went on a trip that just didn't bring him back quite right. And um, from what I understand, that was kind of part of the undoing of, uh, of the original Fleetwood Mac lineup, which is a terrible shame. And, uh, and then the years that followed, uh, you know, I know Peter made some other records, but uh, we really didn't. I, I didn't see those records in Australia. I've heard bits and pieces of, of them now, but uh, but at that time I didn't get my hands on that stuff, you know. And uh, and then he toured. I, I know he toured in the Splinter Group uh, years later, and I'd already you know had discussions with senior musicians about what happened to Peter Green, and I, I don't think I could have made the gig anyway. But but in retrospect, I'm probably glad that I didn't. Because because the Peter Green I want to think about is is the guy from that I well clip on on I think it's on BBC One you know and he's such a guy he's in command you know and, and when he when he opens up with those chords on the on the album of course they're acoustic guitar but he just plays on his on Les Paul but when he opens it up and it all, and lays it down you know he's he's so in control you can see that in his time he was he was a guy ahead of the ahead of the of the of the pack you know and and uh, would have been an amazing time to be in, you know. But you know, here's me hearing this in the eighties, you know, in amongst the flock of seagulls and. <laughs> okay, talking about Peter Green. Anyone that knows Peter Green's playing will uh, probably recognise that as um, his solo from Need Your Love So Bad, which took a lot from B.B. King, uh, but it, it is really uh, so identifiable with Peter Green, that beautiful, lyrical, poetic playing that he would do. And uh, this guitar doesn't sound the same, but, uh, but he had that, that unique sound to the instrument as well. I first became aware of Peter Green through John Mayle and the Blues Breakers. So I'd gotten onto that band through hearing, uh, accidentally hearing the, the original Blues Breakers album with Eric Clapton on guitar. At that time, those kind of records were hard to get. So I was doing flips and twists to get hold of this stuff. And a friend of mine loaned it to me. He, he had copies of all the, the old uh, British blues records. So he loaned me the Blues Breakers album and he gave me another one the follow-up, A Hard Road, with Peter Green on guitar. And he said, if you like Clapton, you're going to love this guy. And, of course, I took that album home and I, I just spun it a million times. Um, and and that, was, that was very, very important in my formative years as a guitar player. I think the difference that I could hear between Clapton's playing and Peter Green's playing was that Clapton had that explosive rebellious, aggressive uh, sort of style. Whereas Peter Green, whilst it was similar, it was, it was like more soulful and uh, maybe a, a little more delicate in parts. The standout track on a hard road is clearly the supernatural. And this was Peter Green's minor key masterpiece with those long sustained feedback notes and I can only imagine that at the time, it, it just must have sounded like it came from Mars. I, I, I don't know of anything recorded in that same era that sounds anything like it. These days you can listen to it and it almost sounds like the blueprint for everything that Carlos Santana did afterwards. In that period of music uh, in, the, in the 60s, that, that, that British blues boom, the, the blues explosion that happened then, uh, everyone was getting hold of these Les Paul guitars is the whole reason I decided I needed one of these guitars, listening to those uh, those people like Clapton and, and Peter Green and 
Mike Bloomfield and Mick Taylor, uh, Dwayne Ormond, uh, all of them sporting these guitars and getting that, that big robust uh, sound. Each one of those players, if you listen to them, whilst they, they all had this same sort of self-expression machine, uh, they all sounded different. And nobody sounded more different than Peter Green because his, his guitar had this odd wiring that uh, guitar players would talk about. It would be written up. There'd be whole articles written on this quirk in Peter Green's guitar, you know, in the, in the magazines and so on. And so you'd, you'd read up on this. It's like, what is the secret? How did it happen? And I understood for years that it was it was a guitar repair job that had uh, that had somehow gone wrong, and there was this happy accident that the guitar sound suddenly had this unique sound. You could see from the photographs that the pickup was around the wrong way. So of course, kids like me got there with a screwdriver and pulled the guitar apart, and I turned my pickup round the other way, thinking I'd, I'd get this same unique sound. Of course, that didn't work because it's it's the same pickup, you know. Um, I've read in more recent times that uh, that it was actually a factory goof, uh, and that that out of phase sound was uh, was was just you know faulty wiring, uh, and and that there were actually more than one guitar went out of the factory like that. It was just a mistake, but that particular guitar wound up in the hands of a very famous and super creative guitar player. So he's the guy that we uh, associate with that unique time. Oh yeah, I, I got to open a show for Peter Green at the Prince of Wales Hotel in St Kilda. Uh, and I, I, I was there to do a solo set. So I, I arrived with my acoustic guitar and uh, when I did my sound check, nobody was there. The band had gone back to the hotel. So I didn't meet anybody beforehand. But I did my set and I, then I walked backstage and, uh, and the whole band was there. So I just walk in, I put my acoustic guitar away and um, no one's talking to me, I'm just the support act, you know, who am I? But, uh, but I, as I'm putting the guitar in, in the case, I could see Peter Green had come in and, he, and he's pointing at the guitar, he's very interested in it. And, and it was this one here. So, so I took it over and I, I said, oh, hey man, well this is, this is my Gibson. I told him all about it and he was very interested. And, uh, and then afterwards, I, I just was able to say, you know, how much his music meant to me, how much I loved his guitar playing and his, and his songwriting. And he was very shy about it. It was, it was hard for him to take, I think. So he's a very sort of reserved personality. So he, he didn't speak to me at all, but I'm just glad I got, I got to say how much his music meant to me and thank you. I think Peter Green's legacy is those incredible, generally minor key masterpieces that he came up with. Of course, The Supernatural, uh, Black Magic Woman, The Green Man Alushi, uh, Oh Well. They were things that, that seemed to have no um, predecessor. They, they came out of nowhere. Uh, they just came out of Green's creativity. And, uh, and, and seemingly had no place on a blues record. But, uh, but for anyone that was a fan of the blues, this, this was another way to express how you felt from deep within. So for someone like me, for a fan that, that listened to him and, uh, and took uh, so much from him, it was that, um, that feeling of camaraderie with a musician like that who was so interested in American blues music and, and really wanted to be faithful to it. But then hearing how he could take that and put his own music together. So I took a lot from that. And that's, you know, that's what I've tried to do in my way. Um, you know, the blues is always there, but, but the lesson is you, you gotta make it your own. What, what have you got to say? What's your message? Another uh, fascination of uh, discovering the Peter Green story uh, was, of course, the guitar greenie. And uh, we were, I was very aware of Gary Moore before I was aware of Peter Green. I'm sorry to the purists, but that's just my generation. But, you know, Gary always was very open about uh, the story about where the guitar came from. It was a great story, you know, his mentor and, and uh, 
uh, and the way he sold his SG to uh, pay for the guitar at, at Peter's request. It's a great story, and um, I don't know if other people remember, but in the in the early 80s, I know that Gibson had reissued some a few flame tops at that time, but where I lived, we never saw one, and there was no such thing as a flame top for, for a long time. In fact, I remember hearing stories about how flame maple was so rare now that they weren't making them anymore. So there was a real mystique. It was like a Stradivarius that if somebody had a burst of flame top. It was a thing. And, you know, Paul Kossoff had one, and we we had I had a picture of that on one of my wall. And the Peter Green Les Paul became another one of those uh, kind of like folklore items. You know, I mean, as you can see, I'm sitting next to a guitar, which is it's not a Peter Green model, but I bought this guitar many years ago because it has a flame. Uh, like the Greeny Burst, and I, I mean, I call it Greeny, I, I mean that with great respect, it's just because it looks like it, you know. <laughs> you know, I, I can recall even when the Blues for Greeny album came out, the Gary Moore released, uh, that was another uh, another brick in, in building the house of Peter Green for me because, uh, you know, they were great recordings, you know, they were modern recordings, I, sh I mean, and, and, and Gary plays great on that record, it's, it's probably my favourite record that he made uh, because it's a more pure tone and... Um, and I think he did a great job in tribute to, to Peter when he made that record. But, uh, you know, we discovered it was another it was another time where we discovered the songs again, you know. And uh, and uh, and that was a thing for me, too, because I, I was trying to write songs and be creative. And even though Peter is known as his blues player and I, I know when his hard road comes on, it's, it's blues straight away. But there were so many things about it that weren't strictly uh, blues, you know, and I, I remind the blues police this on occasion. But, uh, you know, uh, when he played those uh, real minor blues things, you know, to, to me, uh, Black Magic Woman, for example, was a distant cousin to All Your Love, which he didn't play them, but I, you know, just it's the you know, I just Rush songs on the first record that Clapton plays, but it's it's in the, in the root. Uh, no, the root chord is a minor chord. Instead of it being a one four five with kind of like a major root, uh, it's re a real minor song. Uh, so that means when you play that minor sort of scale, I was getting a bit technical or nerdy maybe, but it really sits in in a, in a, in a great way. It, it doesn't have the the tension of like playing a minor pentatonic scale over a major root, which a lot of blues has, you know, and. Um, uh, so playing that minor, you know, the D minor, and 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 playing a real minor scale over it, it, it gives it to me once again, like the supernatural, this spookiness. And I was really obsessed with playing things in minor keys for a long time, you know, because I, I just love that eerie uh, sense that it had, and, and a lot of that had to do with uh, some of those Peter Green tracks because that's how how he um, wrote them, I suppose, and. And I loved his his songwriting, and uh, to understand years later uh, the journey that he had and the struggles that he had, uh, uh, you know, from the end of Peter uh, Fleetwood Mac onwards, is still fascinates me. And and kind of, you know, it's a kind of upsetting story. I mean, I don't, I don't know Peter Green. I don't want to sound like a tosser, but you know, I, I I I'm one of these people who admired these great artists from afar, as you do. So it was kind of a bummer that I never really saw the Splinter Group or I saw Peter play for real. But, you know, I watched a lot of those clips on YouTube, even now when I'm sitting up late when the kids are asleep, you know. And uh, I, I still see him as this guy in command, you know, just uh, just a great talent. But um, somewhere in the about 86, 87, uh, I, I had a band going, an original band, and we were playing kind of a slightly experimental rock kind of, vibe i mean i i think that and um and we got uh, a gig opening for mick fleetwood zoo and uh, mick fleetwood came out to australia to do a tour and i was like really jazzed i was like oh you know mick fleetwood and i'm thinking about the original fleetwood mac you know i mean not that there's anything wrong by the way with the the later incarnation of fleetwood mac that that came along in the 70s and in my later school years you know those those records were great records but it was incredible to think where it all started. And as a guitar player, you know, I, I was fascinated with the Peter Green thing. But, uh, you know, I was kind of hoping that Mick Fleetwood Zoo would uh, maybe play some of, some of that stuff. But to my memory, they really, they didn't. It was kind of like, uh, it looked like they'd thrown together a set on the plane <laughs> on the way over. We, we loved them. Don't, don't get me wrong, Mick, Mick I love you. But, um, but uh, it would have been great to hear uh, some of those classic songs. But I got to meet, meet 
uh, Mr. Fleetwood and uh, a very tall man. And uh, for me, that was a, a special treat because, you know, it was just kind of like shaking hands with uh, the connection of that uh, amazing period in music, you know. So uh, that's kind of cool. You know, I never really knew much about Peter Green way back uh, when I was a kid, you know, because I kind of, when I kind of got into rock guitar, I was listening, you know, I, I would, I liked Hendrix and uh, Jeff Beck, you know, and then later on I started to learn about Peter because I think when I, you know, I always thought of Fleetwood Mac, the newer Fleetwood Mac with Lindsey Buckingham and all those guys, but he was the originator. They were, they were great blues. I mean, I, I, didn't know much about him till like really later on in life when I started to hear about him more and I go, wow, it, it, I just thought he had a great, beautiful, bluesy touch. He, he would play softer sometimes and play louder, you know, a lot of dynamics. And there wasn't really a lot of crunch on his guitar. It just kind of got a natural breakup. But his uh, soulful blues playing, I, I hear it in a lot of players these days. You know, I know Eric Clapton was a big fan of his, but yeah, sad to hear. Uh, it, Died too young, too young. What a player. I think when I was living in Los Angeles, uh, so quite late probably um, in the scheme of things, considering that he's the absolute kind of guitarist that I would love, <laughs> that I do love. Um, a friend of mine gave me the, the Pious Bird album and um, I used to just listen to that and, but that was, you know, not till I came over here, actually. Um, of course I'd heard Albatross, but I, I sort of hadn't delved into the early Fleetwood Mac and, um, till I came, you know, over here. And then lately I've been getting it in, into it even more. I think he was, it has a beautiful soul. And I think that came out with his, in his guitar playing, he's very gifted and, just uh, open. It's like, um, it's not pretentious and it's not technical and it's not, it's just about music, you know, and feeling and emotion and um, it's not theatrics and all that stuff, which I don't really get into, but um, I, there's just something about his personality as well. I've been watching some documentaries about him and He's just such a sort of normal, down-to-earth kind of person. He's not a showbiz. I don't think he, he really handled showbiz very well. And um, that's something I can relate to myself. I think he, he's a good role model musically. Um, those English guys were quite amazing the way they sort of were sponges for the American blues music at such, they were so young. And, but it just sort of spoke to them, you know, and that's one of the greatest things that has ever happened in Western music is that crossover from America, American blues to England, to these young teenage boys over there who started playing this music and America was so segregated that most, many white people actually hadn't heard the blues until it came over in the British invasion. And they thought, I have some friends from Texas who thought that the blues came from England. And um, which is just shows you how segregated their radio stations were and everything was segregated, not just where people were living. Um, and I just think his legacy is just beautiful music, really beautiful guitar playing, um, nothing overdone about it. I don't know, just everything about his music is, is really fantastic. I just love it. When did Peter Green first come across your radar? Um. John Mayall's Blues Breakers. I was, a, I was a huge John Mayall fan. I mean, I was a big blues man. Um, I was a graphic artist and um, that's my original, that was my original job. And um, I worked a lot with uh, Island Records. Um, I remember when Free was starting out. In fact, I was actually masquerading 
a lot of the time as a blues harmonica player, mostly in folk clubs at first. And I went from, if you can understand the progression from Delta blues, you know, originally liking Sun House and Char Charlie Patton and, and uh, you know, Blind Lemon Jefferson and Blind Blake and um, Robert Johnson, of course, you know, all the way following almost Muddy Waters Trail as it went up to Chicago and Detroit. Okay. So, you know, the blues became electric. You know, suddenly you've got people like uh, uh, Otis Rush and Buddy Guy and B.B. King and Bobby Bland as a singer, you know. Uh, so I kind of followed that and developed my path towards electric music. And one person who shared that um, but never wanted to completely leave the Delta behind was John Mayall. Because mm. John Mayall's bands were famous for kind of um, the material. You know, you'd get a Robert Johnson song followed by a Muddy Waters song followed by uh, an Otis Rush song. And the, the musicians that came into that band, first off, it was Clapton as a guitarist, you know. They kind of quickly, they, I mean, John was the teacher, you know. He yeah. taught all these guys so much. Alexis Corner was another one. I mean, I, I sang and played with Alexis Corner, but that more of that later on um, uh, in the conversation because that's where Peter comes in. Anyway, the first time I saw Peter Green, I was shocked because I went to see John Mayall's Blues Breakers play in Worthing in Sussex, near to where I came from in Shoreham by Sea in Sussex, about six miles away from my home. Um, and I thought it was Eric Clapton and this guy with these huge sideburns looking very, very nervous, almost hiding behind his guitar, steps out and played. And, you know, after about five songs, I reckon he was better. You know, there was something about him that was incredibly intense. Not only that, he had the Otis Rush. I loved Otis Rush. He had the same tone. So when they did Double Trouble, you know, world well, full of trouble. And the, he had that exact tone of Otis Rush. And it was creepy because Eric's sound seemed to rely on distortion quite a lot. But Peter's was clean as a whistle. Um, I think at that time he was playing a Fender Strat. Um, and I believe he was going through a Vox amp. And the tone was kind of crystal clear, just like those, you know, American blues men like B.B. King. It was just stinging tone, you know. Um, so I thought, this guy's really interesting, you know. And I remember going backstage afterwards, but he'd left and chatting with John Mayall. Um, you know, look, I'm, I'm only a year younger than Peter Green. So I was about 20, 21 at the time, 20, I think, um, you know, at that gig. So I remember hanging out and asking John Mayall about this guy. And he said, oh, look, we found this guy. He's, um, he's from Bethnal Green. He's, uh, he's a bit of a rough diamond. Um, we never know when he's going to turn up or not, but he's fantastic. Uh, so next week I'm in the studio and we're going to put him on the record. So that was a, a record called A Hard Road, you mm -hmm. know, with John Mayall. And then I guess Peter took, tried to take John McVie with him, um, and John McVie didn't want to leave the Mac, uh, leave the Blues Breakers, but all of a sudden there's this new band, Fleetwood Mac, and we all wondered where the name came from, but then we saw the drummer, Mick Fleetwood, so Fleetwood Mac, Mick Fleetwood, um, and they played in a little club in, called Jimmy's in Brighton in 1967, I believe. Uh, end of 1967, cusp of 19, 1968. And I went to the gig, and honestly, I was one of 15 people in there. Well, <laughs> it was a great little blues club. And I, you know, I'd seen lots of people before there, you know, Tony McPhee with Joanne Kelly and all these kind of um, Ainsley Dunbar sitting in with Victor Brox and, uh, oh, I don't know, you know, Stan Webb, Chicken Shack, I think was on the week before. I was a blues fanatic by this time. I was wearing my ex-army, um, uh, ex-RAF, -X dark blue duffel, uh, duffel coat, raincoat. Um, no, 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 sort of um, great coat. It was a, they, we all went to army surplus stores. That's what we wore. I mean, Peter used to wear a lumberjack shirt, you know, when I first saw him. And he was in the same lumberjack shirt as when I saw him in the Fleetwood Mac as he was in the, in the Blues Breakers. So, you know, not much changed. There was no money around, you know. Guys like that would spend everything on their guitars and their gear, you know. So, so this band comes on stage and they're a scruffy bunch of bastards. And Jeremy Spencer, the, the guitarist who's playing this big old, um, oh, I think it was a Framus or something, um, massive, great big semi-acoustic. Um, whenever Peter did a song, he'd slip behind the amps 
and there'd be these hordes of smoke coming out. You knew he was having a joint. And that's what they used to do. And then when Jeremy would be on, Peter would slip me on, and there'd be this huge pall of smoke coming up from behind the amps. Because they'd just go and sit behind, there was no dressing room. So he sat behind the amps. And the drummer was crazy. He scared me to death, actually, because I went backstage afterwards to meet them. There were only a few of us there, you know. And um, I think I was talking to Peter, and then Fleetwood came over, and he, he had these kind of, I don't know how to describe it, but these balls hanging. Have you seen those pictures? <laughs> Soft, furry balls hanging down on a piece of string from his belt, looking like... So when he played, the balls would be hanging around and dancing. <laughs> like those, those metal things that go... Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> so, look, they were a funny mob. And, and, and they were naughty, you know, it was, the theme was, it was very, it was all mischievous laughs between them, in jokes and everything. You could see it all going on. The only guy I think not joining in was McVie, but then, you know, McVie's always been this, you see him now in Fleetwood Mac and he never says a word and he's always standing in the background, you know. Um, so anyway, I, so I'm, I'm talking to Peter and then Fleetwood comes over and starts intimidating me just, just because that's what he was like. You know, and I'm scared and I want to leave. And Pete grabs hold of my arm and he said, no, sit down. He said, what do you want to know? I said, well, you've got a song um, on the first album, Long Grey Mare, I think it was. And oh, I just, I just love the way you play. It's like an acoustic guitar, you know. How do you get that? But you're on the electric. He said, ah, he said, you know, I did something clever with the guitar. And of course, this is the out of phase thing. You know, when you flick to the middle switch, it becomes like a Strat. And he said, I was after this clean tone. And I said, yeah, well, when I saw you play in Blues Breakers, I was amazed that you got the same tone. He said, well, I listened to those records and I love those records and I love that sound. And, you know, I, I, and he told me that he thought Eric's sound, he loved Eric. He was a fan of Eric, but he said, it's too dirty. I wanted it clean. I thought, you know, I'd leave more space in the band. So he was intelligent, you know, he was already thinking about his place in that John Mayall band. And, how he would not stand out, but be wanted by John, uh, you know. So he was, he was po politic in a way, you know. And I was very, very impressed with, with that, you know. Mm. And um, so I chatted away. And Jeremy Spencer is lovely was a lovely chap as well. So I was chatting to the two of them with a couple of mates, you know. And we're asking them all sorts of questions, you know. Uh, well, when you shot the cover, uh, where's the dustbin? What street is that? You know, oh, yeah, you know. And, um, You've got this dodgy manager, you know, why are you with him? You know, Clifford Adams, who, who gets the writing credit, have you seen, for nearly all those songs, like Albatross, never did a fucking thing, but he's got the co-writing credit on all Peter Green's songs. So he always picked up 50%. He was the manager as Clifford Davis, because he changed his name from Adams. He's CJ Adams, you'll see on the co-writing of all those, those songs, Love That Burns and, you know, um, Stop Messing Around, Albatross. All those songs, you know, um, you know, there was, I think there was a kind of a little bit of a, who's the leader of this band going on when I saw them that time. That was very early on. Peter would have said that Jeremy was the main man because whenever they played, the first songs were always Jeremy. The first set, Peter would only come on after a third number or so. I saw them many times. I was a huge fan. After seeing that in Jimmy's, I, I hitched hiked up to London. I saw them play the Marquee. I saw them play so many places, the Roundhouse. I saw so many gigs. I could tell you the set list of every show. And Peter would often see me out there and go, oh, it's you again. <laughs> so <laughs> I became this boring fan. And he didn't know I played harmonica until I was Duster Bennett, you know, the harmonica player and blues, blues singer. Um, he was doing a session. I think they were doing it with some, uh, who was the, um, um, uh, Memphis Slim, the pianist, who was often with Muddy Waters. So Memphis Slim is cutting an album in London and there's a rehearsal and I hear about the rehearsal. So I go up there and there's Peter and McVie and, um, and Duster Bennett. And I'm kind of like standing on the sidelines. And Duster Bennett knew I could play harmonica because he knew I'd played with Alexis Corner. So he said, let him play, cheeky bugger, because I could hardly play as good as Duster, you know. But, so I jammed with them, you know. So I can say that, you know, in a roundabout way, although Peter kind of ignored me, I did jam with Peter Green. <laughs> You're not a guitarist, but how does a, a great instrumentalist like Peter influence your music? His singing and his tone and his passion. 
was unbelievable. His timing as well. You know, when you listen to him do, you know, sing Love That Burns or Need Your Love So Bad, his phrasing is, it's up there with Bobby Bland. I'm, I'm sorry. You know, it's really, it's up there with the greats, up there with BB. Um, I don't know what it is about guitarists, you know, Freddie King, Albert King, all the Kings, <laughs> Otis Rush, Buddy Guy. There's something about their timing of, of what, the, you know, when you, when you, when you pick a, a note, uh, you're a guitarist, I'm sure. Uh, very you know bad. that slight, <laughs> no, but you know that slight delay when the pick comes down the string and then the sound comes out the amp. I think that that teaches them all to be great singers because timing is of the essence. You know, you can pull that note back. You know, you can pull that note back till it's right at the, almost the end of the beat with a guitar. And I think guitarists then use that kind of choice of phrasing, choice of timing to make them great singers. So Peter's voice, I love Peter's voice. It was just pure passion. And his tone was, well, I was a big fan of John Coltrane as well at the same time. So, you know, I mean, and people would ask me, said, who's your favorite singer? I'd go, John Coltrane. Because to me, the voices can also be an instrument, you see? The whole thing blurs. Yeah. And Peter's phrases, I must admit, I nicked a few of them, you know. I'd, I'd start a song going, if you could see me, you know, and that's the start of Love That Burns. Bum, 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 bee, dum, dee, dee. It's the same phrasing. So, you know, Peter was an incredible influence on me. I mean, I don't like to profess and say that um, I knew him well. I never, no, not many people did, but I certainly didn't. But he, he would give me a passing glance. And as I say, at that time in Jimmy's, he did speak to me. I think a later time, uh, I was asking about Love That Burns because I said, I'm, I, I'm using your line to sing with. He said, oh, that's great. He said, what, you, you know, the vocal line? I said, no, the guitar line. He said, oh, that's incredible. He was blown away by that. And I said, what's the song about? And he said, God. And then, and then he kind of laughed and he said, had you there? <laughs> so he would never take himself seriously. Yeah. Yet on yeah. stage and in the studio, there's this kind of unbelievable passion. And the passion in the end won over. Um, you know, it caused all the conflicts. Oh, sorry, my ears are popping out. It caused all the conflicts in his mind. You could see it coming, you know. He was, I don't know. It was as if he was possessed by another thought inside him. And I don't think he, he liked being famous either, you know, to boot, which is, I think, again, why Cliff Davis or Cliff Adams was in there as the co-writer and protector and the shield, you know? Yeah. I mean, Mick Fleetwood didn't need a shield. Um, definitely Jeremy Spencer didn't, but Peter did, you know? But what would you say Peter Green's legacy is? Um, being one of the most passionate uh, uh, guitarists, singers, and definitely songwriters of that age. I mean, his, his gifts were, well, they're obvious. They were there on the records. But I think he had, a, he had such an influence on people because, you know, when he played, even the position he held the guitar in was, I don't know, more grace than all the other guys. I mean, you know, you know, got... Jimmy, Jimmy Page slinging it down there and almost insulting his Les Paul. You've got, you've got, you've got Eric kind of like, um, you know, it's all, in, it's all in the fingers. But Peter, the passion that he played with, if you'd have seen him live, you'd have, you'd have understood. And I think that live, there was just, I've never heard, you know, when he played that first time with John Mayle, people were talking, you know, during the Mayle's numbers and everything, but when the solos were on, everybody went silent. You could have heard a pin drop. We realized that, you know, sometimes when you're in the presence of somebody quite, I mean, I, I once flew on a plane with Muhammad Ali, you know, <laughs> and you know, when you're in the presence of, you're in what, you know, there's one of the, I did album covers for Bob Marley and later I supported Bob Marley in America and spending time with Bob, you know, oh, Ayrton Senna was another one. You know, you realize when you're with the greats, and I'd, I'd put Peter in there with Ali, Senna, yeah, any of them, you know. He was, he was a god. He was a god on earth. I, I don't know how else to describe it, but there was something very special happening in that man. It was divine intervention that brought him to us. And that comes over in the music, you know. 
uh, the battle with the devil, you know, Green Man Alishi, um, the, 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 the hatred of fame, man of the world, um, the beauty and simplicity of Albatross, you know, need your love so bad. One of the most passionate vocals ever sung by an Englishman, which is interesting, isn't it? Or an English, you know, an Anglo-Saxon rather than a black guy. You know, I mean, that, that, his performance on that, on that song, you know, Jesus, it's incredible. Yeah. You think you're listening to a black guy. You do. And when he plays, you know, it could be Otis or Otis Rush or BB or Freddie King. He's up there in that league. He's equal to them. And not many people are. You know, Paul Kossoff and Eric Clapton would have always said that, oh, no, they're, they're, better, they're better than me. I don't think Peter ever got a chance to say it. But BB King said it. He said, that guy really scares me. And I'm, I'm so glad I got to you know, to be in his presence, to see him up close, to shake his hand, to talk to him. Um, as I say, I never got to know him, um, but I was very aware of, of, that he was a great. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and kind of after those days when he left Fleetwood Mac, I got to say I was very depressed because um, after Green Man Alicia and you heard he gave everything away and I never saw him in the later times. I know friends of mine who did see him and friends who didn't have very nice episodes with him. But, um, you know, I didn't really, I didn't really sort of want to see him in Splinter Group and all those things because I remembered that amazing guy and a friend, friendly guy as well, you know, shy and friendly, mm. um, gracious chap, you know. I, my mother's favorite song was Albatross. And I think it's a great instrumental. You know, well, is it just a classic? Other than those, those two songs, were, I mean, those two tracks were great. And then there's some other stuff that, you know, I've since heard. I mean, he, and he was, he was of that blues genre that was happening, you know, which we all, which a lot of British people, of course, were very much tuned into. By the time I hit 16, and, um, you, you know, you had this amazing flowering of British guitarists, that um, not only were they British, but they, they were starting to really um, dominate things. You know, Jeff Beck with the Yardbirds, um, Jimmy Page, uh, you know, specifically Eric Clapton was a massive influence. Um, you know, his debut with John Mayall's Blues Breakers um, was really something that um, jolted us all, you know, because we hadn't particularly listen to a lot of American blues players. So that was our pathway, our entry into blues. And really for me, it all came to a head with Peter Green because that's when I was old enough to really appreciate blues playing and, and, the, and the, the intense emotion behind it. And I hadn't had the, the benefit of seeing Eric Clapton live, but I did get the benefit of seeing Peter Green um, Really, it was their inaugural gig with uh, Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac in 1967. So I was at the tender age of 17. I'd already seen a lot of um, amazing bands, you know, uh, bands like The Kinks, The Who. Um, I saw Cream, you know, their warm-up gig uh, on the same festival, which was the Windsor Jazz and Blues Festival in 1967. So, you know, I was, and I was listening to stuff... Um, you know, like a lot of teenagers, you know, we'd have record, record, record evenings at friends' houses and we were getting records from the United States, specifically things like, like um, Mothers of Invention, Frank Zappa. And, and so, you know, our, our minds were literally being blown. But as a guitar player, obviously, you know, I come up through the ranks playing initially uh surf style music the music of hank b marvin and the shadows and then also when i was about 14 15 started playing a lot of soul music and before the blues i was really initiated into blue beat and soul and then then i then i got you know i thought i was mostly a rhythm guitar player at that time but it was really uh you know, I, I decided to venture into single string soloing after hearing Clapton and specifically Peter Green. And Peter Green moved me so much in concert that I was a phenomenal, um, 
uh, inspiration to me personally. Now, the inspiration that I got, we got from Peter Green and Fleetwood Mac as a band, that came a couple of years later. Well, it was at that show. I didn't actually meet him. I, I was 17. They finished their set in the tent of the Windsor Jazz and Blues Festival. It was their first date um, as a blues band. And um, I, was just, I just loved that, that shuffle beat, you know, and um, Mick Fleet would particularly capture my ears as, you know, an incredible um, ability to play that, that Chicago style of blues. Um, but in the set, I was right in the front and totally overcome, you know, and um, as a young kid, I, I leapt up on stage at the, <laughs> uh, 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 at the end of their set and, and dragged Peter back on, you know, it was in a very friendly manner, um, nothing violent about it. And, you know, he, he very definitely they, they wanted to play an encore and everyone, the feeling in the, in the crowd was just phenomenal because, you know, there was this anticipation every time a new player came on the scene that it was going to be something I mean I can't really describe the um the, the feeling at the time but um I think British youth in general was looking for this escape that guitar players could definitely lift you out of the doldrums they could definitely lift you your spirits and you know seeing Peter Green and um and, and watching the white it's an insane amount of emotion that he would put into his playing um, that was what really fired me up, and I think I think the same thing also happened to Ted Turner in a in a separate situation. My my co guitar player in Wishbone Ash, he grew up in Birmingham, um, in the Midlands, and um, I think he had a similar epiphany with Peter, you know, as an audience member, as a, a listener, um, you know, and a fledgling guitar player. So you know, we were ripe for it, and I think after that. I kind of, I think, I, you know, I started to, um, I made some f futile attempts to sort of get a straight job and, you know, I, I did well at school. I could have gone to university, but I think that the mojo, it, it got me, you know, and um, it was only two years later that I, I decided to go professional and, um, and, you know, when we formed Wishbone Ash in London, I was, I was still tender age of 19, so um, the fire was still burning in the belly, as they say. Growing up um, in Arizona was when I remember that the the album before Rumors, the Fleetwood Mac album. The, it's it's also cream coloured. <laughs> um, that was in our house, and so in the in the yeah mid to late seventies, I uh, you know I'd sit on the floor and listen to that record like like I listened to every every record at the time, and uh, and so that is where I kind of picked up with Fleetwood Mac. But then when I moved to New York and uh, in 97 or 98, um, I started going to Tower Records a, a lot. And uh, especially uh, I'd, I kind of got into this habit of like putting the kids down, cleaning up the kitchen, blah, blah, blah. And then I'd get on my bike and ride down Lafayette because they were up until one in, in the morning. And it was, it was a really good time to kind of walk around a record shop like yeah, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. It's just got the place to yourself, more or less. Um, and um, I discovered the Fleetwood Mac. I was looking through, you know, rock section or whatever, and saw these Fleetwood Mac albums, and they just kept going and going and going. And it was sort of the penny dropped. It was like, wow, this is, um, is this the same Fleetwood Mac? Like there's all this back catalogue, which I felt kind of a bit sort of, silly not to have known about. And so I bought, like, I think it was a greatest hits or something from that period. And that of course was all the Peter Green stuff. And of course, Albatross was on it and Black Magic Woman. Um, and um, what's the song with that really cool riff? Oh, well. Oh, well, exactly. Those, so those three were like, I know these songs. I like, and then it started, oh, okay. So, I mean, then it became really obvious that then I started, you know, seeing things in Mojo magazines and kind of getting a, a whole, you know, articles about Fleetwood Mac, the early Fleetwood Mac before Lindsay Buckingham and, and Stevie Nicks. And I started kind of my education, I guess, it well and truly kicked off by then. So 
yeah, um, I can't say that I grew up listening to Peter Green because I didn't. You know, he just, um, I guess by the 70s uh, into the 80s, yeah, the Fleetwood Mac as a super group um, were just so massive. And that whole super group, uh, Fleetwood, Fleetwood Mac, the blues band, you know, like the Alexis Corner and uh, John Mayall, Blues Breakers, and, you know, essentially the Rolling Stones, they've all started out as these blues bands that, you know, all actually, funny enough, all roads seem to lead to Alexis Corner. They all talk about him. And, um, yeah, Fleetwood Mac were definitely, you know, a big, big piece of that British blues thing. But, again, by the, by the time album-orientated rock had come along, it, you know, the new Fleetwood Mac was the one that everyone knew. So, um, and, and, and understandably, those albums were massive, you know, and what a, an amazing band they turned out to be. I think the adding of Christine McVie and um, Stevie was just such a great, great thing, the two females in that band. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's great to kind of, kind of uh, to, to discover something like that. That's, you know, you feel like it's a, it, it, it's a real discovery. It was for me. I felt like I discovered like a treasure trove of stuff. Mm -hmm. what, what did you like about Peter's playing? Oh, well, I mean, he's incredible. I mean, look, I think Fluid Mac must have, I mean, if you look, they, they had quite an amazing history of just always having really good, uh, very um, lyrical and eloquent sort of players in the band, you know, for basically what is essentially a, a rhythm section, bass and drums, you know, John McVie and and Mick Fleetwood, they would they had good yeah good instincts to like know who was going to be right for the band. Um, Peter Green, you know, he had he had you know the songwriting thing, which is amazing. Of course, I grew up with Santana's version of Black Magic Woman. That was the one I knew. I didn't know that version. So when you hear the original, it, it's like it's all there, you know. And and I just love his his playing is 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 yeah so lyrical. It really. Um, is probably one of the most lyrical players I, I've, I've come across as far as, um, you know, it's, it's rock guitar. Yes. It's, you know, um, it's a Les Paul most of the time I believed, you know, and it, there's, you know, there's that, that tone and that thing, but it, but it's not just playing widdly squiddly diddlies. It, it's like every note that he would choose, he was like, you know, it was as important as the lyric and the melody that he's singing. So it, it, his guitar just was like an extension of his of his of his sense of, of melody and lyric lyric lyrics. I feel, and that's yeah that that combination of singer songwriter and really good amazing guitar player is you know that doesn't come every every day sort of thing. So you know that puts him in that you know special special echelon yeah. to me always will. Because yeah, great guitar players, sure. They, you know, I wouldn't say a dime a dozen, but to be able to sing and write songs like he did, that that really puts it in a different light. And then you know the instrumental, Albatross, probably my favorite instrumental, next to Sleepwalking by um, Santo and Johnny. That's probably my favorite instrumental from a from a guitar or lap steel, or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's my, one of my favorite, if not the favorite, instrumental of all time. When did Peter Green first come across your radar? Uh, about 1967, a um, friend of mine uh, turned me on to the John Mayall albums with, with Eric Clapton. And then he said, and wait to hear the second one. The guy's even, even better in some ways, Peter Green. I'm like, oh, Peter Green. So, you know, I, at that point had been a big, you know, I'd, I'd gotten into blues, I guess, from two sources, once there was a TV show on TV on Saturday called The Beat, and um, and I saw Freddie King perform there. I was, you know, he was on quite a lot, Gatemouth Brown, and, and of course the Rolling Stones had all those blues songs on their records. I was big fans of all of that, and uh, the English Invasion, all the the Animals, and all those were doing blues songs. I just, you know, you start put two and two together. And, find out who all these great artists were. And, uh, 
So uh, I hadn't heard about uh, Clapton and Peter Green and John Mayo until my friend told me about it. And of course I got the records and, uh, and was impressed. And being a guitar player, you want to learn all you can. And so I would copy or try to learn the, what they were playing from listening to the records. Yeah. What was it about Peter's playing and his tone that you liked? Well, I think the first thing that made an impression was, um, was the supernatural. His tone on the first, on, on that male record, A Hard Road, was sort of borrowed in a sense from the first album that featured uh, Eric Clapton. You know, it was the Les Paul through the Marshall. But, but on his uh, original song, The Supernatural, uh, I think that he was starting to develop uh, a little bit of a style that was, that was going in a slightly different direction. And, uh, and I, I was impressed with that and, and also with his singing. You know, he, he was a great singer right off the bat. And, um, and he was, you know, looking back, I didn't know it at the time, he was probably only maybe 20 years old or something like that. So that was pretty advanced for a guy that age. Yeah. Uh, you joined Fleetwood Mac in 1987 through to 91 with Billy Burnett. What Peter, yes. Green, what Peter Green tunes were the band playing at that stage? And did you advocate for more Peter Green tunes once you were entrenched in the band? They weren't doing any Peter Green. They weren't doing anything from that era. And I said, wow, well, this is my chance because I know this material. And so I went to John and Mick. I said, look, um, it wouldn't make sense for me to do original songs with me joining the band at this late hour when you have a tour plan and a record to promote. Well, why not devote a little section of the, of the set to the original Peter Green era Fleetwood Mac? I can do I Loved Another Woman, Rattlesnake Shake, Oh Well, and, uh, and maybe there was one more that we, we tossed out. So that was, that was uh, smiled upon. And uh, so we did that. And, um, and actually, it, it, it came to be much appreciated from the Fleetwood Mac fans uh, who were around way before the Stevie Nicks era in the mid 70s. And, uh, and it came to be much appreciated. And, and it broke up the set nicely and kind of brought the thing a full circle. Yeah. Uh, being a, a Peter Green fan, um, how did it feel playing? those songs with that rhythm section. Do you remember the first time you played one of the songs yeah. with those guys? Well, I had been playing some of those songs since I first heard them, you know? And so, but playing it with Mick and John was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm really here doing this, you know, because they were so great at it. And, uh, and they loved it too, because they hadn't done it in years. And uh, so for them, it was, it was uh, I think, just as much of a treat. Yeah. Uh, you also worked with uh, John Mayall and the Blues Breakers. So you, you're truly uh, entrenched in that Peter Green lineage. Um, how was the experience of working with John? Because he introduced the world to so many great guitarists, didn't he? Exactly. In late 1974, uh, my, my friend Larry Taylor, who was the bassist with Can't Heat, was also working with John, and John was looking for a new guitarist. So uh, he called me up and asked me if I was interested in going up there to John's infamous place in Laurel Canyon in Los Angeles. So of course I was, you know, I had many of his records. And, uh, and like you said, if you were invited to play with John Mayall as a guitarist, that was a big deal. And so I went up there and uh, he was very nice and just uh, we played and jammed on a couple of numbers. And at the end of that, he said, well, if you want the gig, you're in. I said, I want the gig. Yes, please, sir. And uh, so, yeah, it was great. And so a couple of weeks later, we went into the studio to cut a brand new record. And that would have been November. And that record was finished in about a week because he worked very quickly. Uh, and in January of 75, the record came out. It was called New Year, New Band, New Company. And uh, so we toured. By February, we were out touring in, 
in Europe. So that's how quickly things came together when you work with John Mayo. Yeah. yeah a lot of energy. Uh, you actually got to meet Peter Green. Um, tell me about that experience. Well, that was many years later after that. Um, this would have been 1999. And I was on tour with Bonnie Raitt. So uh, it was even after Fleetwood Mac and everything, 1998, 99, I was on tour with Bonnie Raitt. And we played in Seattle at a festival there. And I looked and saw in the program, oh my gosh, it's Peter Green is playing here with his Splinter group. So uh, he was on in the late afternoon. We weren't on till the evening. So I went over to where he was and I told the, the uh, uh, road manager I'd like to meet him. I told him who I was. And so I met him and, and I said to Peter, my name is Rick Vito. And he said, oh, that sounds familiar. <laughs> and uh, so we went backstage, chatted a little bit. I watched his set and invited him to come to our show. Bonnie Raitt's show that evening and uh, got him set up in the stands and I gave him a, uh, oh, uh, I forgot to tell you, I, I gave him one of my CDs. I had cut uh, a version of, of his song, uh, I Loved Another Woman, and I showed him on the CD. I said, look, I've cut your song here. I said, oh, I didn't really write that. <laughs> he said, that's really a Howling Wolf song. I just changed the lyrics. I said, well, to me, it's a Peter Green song. I understand, you know, what you're saying. So uh, he came and watched the show. And afterwards, I went up and found him. And I said, well, how'd you like the show? He said, not very much. <laughs> I said, oh, well, what was wrong? He said, it was too cold. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the one time I met Peter. He, he told it like it was, even with regards to himself and to what he was experiencing, you know. But it was a great thrill. I was glad to have met him. Yeah. His uh, 59 Les Paul Standard is one of the most famous guitars in the world. Um, yeah. I, I believe you got to uh, pick it up and have a bit of a play? Three different times. Uh, the first time, uh, Gary Moore was opening up for Fleetwood Mac. He had a tribute record out to Peter. And he had the guitar. And uh, I asked if I could see it. And me and Mick got to see it, play it, give it a kiss. And, uh, and then Gary, of course, uh, he did a great job with it. The second time I was at a guitar show in Dallas and the fellow who Gary sold the guitar to had it there. And uh, again, I got to hold it and play it, have my picture taken with it. And then recently for the third time in London in uh, early March, of course, we did the Peter Green tribute show, which you might want to talk more about later. But uh, it was then owned by Kirk Hammett of Metallica. And he was kind enough to have everyone who cared to have their picture formally taken with the guitar. And uh, so I had some shots taken with the guitar then and uh, some shots with Billy Gibbons and I with the guitar. So, yeah, it's truly an iconic guitar. And I'm fortunate enough that I own a guitar that looks and sounds almost identical to Peter's as a 58. And I'm not sure if, if Peter's is the 58 or 59, I forgot to look, but uh, it looks the same and sounds very similar. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the, the tribute show in, in London. Um, well, tell me about the experience. Okay, so uh, this was something that uh, Mick had been talking about doing for years prior. And uh, Mick and I sort of, uh, in I think 2016, we sort of went a little bit different ways and uh, hadn't been in touch. So on Christmas Day, I got a call from Mr. Fleetwood this year, or 2019. And uh, he said, look, we're doing this tribute show. It's, it's coming off. And uh, I just, I cannot see doing the show without you being a part of it because knowing how faithful you are to the style of Peter and everything. And, you know, I just like to kind of uh, mend some fences and have you be a part of the show and be featured and so on. So uh, 
he told me that uh, Billy Gibbons was part of it, Peter, Peter Townsend, David Gilmore, uh, Johnny Lang, Zach Starkey, Bill Wyman. Uh, let's see, who else am I leaving out? Steve uh, Tyler. Steven Tyler. Yeah. And, uh, and he said that and secretly, Jeremy Spencer might be a part of it too. And who knows, we'll invite Peter to come if he wants to come. He can if he wants to play. Certainly, you know, everyone would love that. So uh, I thought about it and I thought, yeah, I got to do this. So uh, we, we went to Maui to rehearse with a core band. It also included uh, David Bronze. Johnny Lang was there. And uh, well, anyway, we rehearsed there for two weeks. And uh, then we went to London for another week of rehearsal that uh, and, and some of the other guys, you know, the, the very well-known uh, participants showed up there and we all played. And uh, I'm glad we rehearsed. They came off with a hitch, without a hitch, I should say, on the night of the show. And uh, of course, we didn't know what to expect, but the crowd was, was, uh, you know, oh, Andy Fairweather Lowe, I don't want to forget. He was also from Clapton's band and a uh, great friend now and was instrumental in this whole thing right from the start. So, uh, yeah, it was just an amazing show. Uh, was there a highlight for you? The highlight for me, well, Nick put out a book. It was a personal... Um, loving tribute to the early Fleetwood Mac with Peter. Um, and the title of the book was um, Love That Burns. And Love That Burns was another one of those tunes that I resurrected from the first record. And I said, let's do this, you know. So with the Mick Fleetwood Blues Band, which is another thing that I was a part of yeah. with Mick for about 10 years. Uh, that was a highlight of that show. So getting to perform that particular song um, with knowing that, uh, at that point I didn't know whether Peter had come or not, but I knew that his brother was there and I knew that this was going to be recorded and videotaped. It was being uh, taped for later release. Knowing that I got to do that song, which was maybe maybe my favorite of uh, Peter's early songs, it was for me personally, the highlight of the show. But there were many highlights of that show because it was just incredible. Yeah. Playing with Billy, playing with Bill Wyman, you know, from the Stones, the guy that, that initially turned me on to this kind of music, and, you know, almost made me want to cry. So uh, yeah, it was an amazing experience. Yeah. So how did you find out about Peter's passing? Uh, I think uh, someone posted it on Facebook and I, I looked it up on uh, BBC and I found out that it was true. So I quickly did a fast little tribute to him uh, on Facebook and, the, you know, there was many more to come, but I certainly wanted to. And, and then I, con I contacted Mick and he, he called me back, very distraught, of course very upset. And we talked about, you know, what he meant to both of us and uh, the man and the music. Yeah. What do you think Peter Green's legacy is? I think Peter, Peter at his peak was the epitome of incredible singer, incredible songwriter, incredible band leader, incredible guitar player who took the styles of, say, B.B. King, Highland Wolf, Sonny Boy Williamson, Otis Rush, and probably Freddie King and, you know, the seminal blues guys, and fused that into a style and, blend, and was one of the vanguards of, of, along with the Stones and Eric Clapton, of introducing that 
and blending it with some rock influences that sort of influenced the generation. Uh, certainly influenced the guitarists that were to follow, myself included, Santana comes to mind, Billy Gibbons comes to mind, many, many of us. Just, it's something that wasn't only heard, it was felt. But it, I saw him live, and I saw the original Mac live in 69, December, a few days before they went to, or maybe it was 68, 68 I believe, before they went to Chicago to record the, the Blues Jam at Chess double record. And they were at their peak and seeing him live, I was able to see everything that had not been captured on record to date. You know, there was two Fleetwood Mac records out and the mail album, but this went so far past that. I had seen everybody. I'd seen Clapton and Hendrix. And although I thought Hendrix was, was amazing, I saw Jeff Beck, I saw everybody. But when I saw him, it was truly something not only special, but something that resonated with me personally and gave me a sort of career direction. That's the way I want to play. Understated, really paying a lot of attention to, to tone and what not to play and when to let it go. You know, so that was what was really special about him for me. I think when I was about 15, I was given a, uh, a compilation, two disc compilation CD. I think it was called like the, the, you know, the ultimate blues compilation. And it was a double disc and this company called Castle Communications bought it out. And they used to bring out really interesting stuff. Um, you know, they had licensing for lots of interesting things and, you know, there were bands like Savoy Brown and uh, Juicy Lucy and all these sort of interesting bands. Um, but, yeah, I heard Black Magic Woman and I remember reading an interview with Gary Moore where he talked about the Les Paul, the Peter Green Les Paul. And, um, and then I listened and I thought, oh, that must be the guitar because it's just got this really particular, very distinctive voice. And... Um, but I really listened to it and I just thought that is just the coolest sound, you know, the heavy reverb. And that guitar solo was just so melodic and well paced and the tone was amazing. And um, from that point on, that was pretty much like the, that was where I went, oh, so that's what phrasing is. That's what, taste is that's what tone is you know because up to that point i'd you know i'd been sort of pre pretty heavy into sort of gary moore and it started to get into hendrix and and also it was sort of the start of the 90s end of the 80s at start of the 90s where you know flying in a blue dream and passion and warfare and all those sort of shreddy guitar albums they were they were the things and i heard all those things as well and um so to hear this other thing and just have it hit and for just, just to go, that is the coolest thing I think I've ever heard. So that was when I heard him and I just I instantly walked down to Greensboro Plaza and bought, there was like a, a best of the original Fleetwood Mac comp CD for about eight bucks and I couldn't believe it. It was, you know, wow, it's got like 18 songs on it. And then I just started going through that and jamming along and learning about that. So Peter Green, yes, yeah, since I was about 15, yeah. Interestingly enough, I didn't hear about Peter Green before I heard him. He was one of those names that just somehow slipped through between the cracks as far as, I mean, I was, when I was a teenager and I was discovering, you know, guitar and getting hev more heavily into music, I was reading up about anyone I could find out about, you know, anything that was on the radio that had some guitar in it, I was giving it an ear, you know, and. And I was always keen to to source 
influences that people had. So, if, you know, if I was into Ry Cooter or someone, I'd find out who he liked and so on. But for some reason, Peter Green's name had, had escaped my attention. And it just, it happened that um, I was, would have been about, I guess, 19 um, thereabouts. And at a music store in my hometown, which was Geelong, they had a, a cassette in there in, it was in the blues section. Um, and it was um, some kind of, of bootleg, I guess, from the live at the Boston Tea Party recordings of, of Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac. And so um, there was this cover with, I mean, I'd heard of Fleetwood Mac and I, I, I kind of liked them, you know, um, but I knew the more famous incarnation at the time. And I was looking at it going, huh, bunch of blokes, you know, it had this sort of promo shot, like kind of, taken from across the road or something from above of, of the guys in the original lineup of Fleetwood Mac all kind of milling about on the street. And it was this kind of black and white photo with green and white writing on it. And it's called Fleetwood Mac live. Um, and, and I thought oh, it was, it was secondhand and it was in, in, you know, in the blues section. So I thought oh, I'll check it out. And so it, it had, it had a few of the Jeremy Spencer led um, Elmore James numbers and it had, Oh, well, part one, Black Magic Woman, Jumping at Shadows, and I think the Green Man Alishi. Um, I think that was then a couple of Danny Kerwin songs, you know, and it was, so it was, a, it was about like an album length, you know, about 50 minutes or thereabouts cassette. And, and it really um, blew me out. I, it was, and it was a great thing for me because I was so into, you know, I was really getting into guitar playing and, and music and, and, diving in deep wherever I could find something and to, to find something that was um, hadn't been told to me or someone I hadn't read about it. It was like a discovery. Um, and I, I became kind of evangelical for a while there with, you know, with musician friends going, check this out. Have you heard of this guy? Um, you know, I'd heard people like BB King and so on. Um, but he was taking the influence of, of players that I'd heard and, and doing something, you know, his own with it, which was, you know, and, and I'd heard Eric Clapton at that stage. I'd heard the Blues Breakers album with John Mayall, with Clapton's playing. And so I could hear connections there between these other things, but but you got the sense that Peter Green was very much his own man. Um, I was really happy with the Splinter Group first time I heard it, I sort of brought tears to my eyes because I thought he's back and he's playing, you know, and because I'd read the, the stories and everything about how sick he was and how his uh, mental health was just so mismanaged horribly for most of his, well, for his life, really. Um, so Splinter Group made me feel joyous for him because it was a new thing and you could you could sort of still hear that the magic was in there you know um but obviously all the Fleetwood Mac albums the three like the early ones and earlier this year you know before the world got shut down Jeff Lang and I did a um we played the album then play on uh, we played a show over at the caravan now defunct caravan club um in at the end of february and it was um it was amazing just uh getting up on stage and jeff and i were just just throwing the ball around and we sort of we knew the the, the live versions a lot better than the studio versions because um the live at the boston tea party albums the fleetwood mac that you can get them all as sets and um there's some really monstrous jamming that goes on on those albums. And so, like, we, we would do that, you know, like we did the 25-minute version of, of Rattlesnake Shake and I'm playing Peter's parts and Jeff's playing Danny's parts and then there's this point where we sort of flipped it where he was doing Peter and I was doing Danny and but we were just filling in all the little spots, you know. Um, it was really good fun because, you know, Shannon can play anything on guitar. He's, he's all over it. And um, it was fun just having, I mean, it was a good band too. Justin Garner is, is a really good guitar player too. So, and he was part of the band. Um, but a lot of the stuff that, that, that I played um, on the night were 
sort of the Danny Kerr and Peter Green twin guitar, you know, onslaught stuff. And, 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 and it was fun because we'd kind of swap roles a bit, you know, it wasn't sort of like, okay, on this song, Peter took the lead and Danny played rhythm and we'll do it exactly like that. We'd kind of, you know, swap out. So for some of a song, he'd be playing the Danny Kerwin role and I'd be playing the Peter Green role and then we'd swap at a certain point just, and didn't even really need to talk about it because we both know that material really well. Well, he had a beautiful guitar sound. Um, anyone who's, you know, any guitar player I've spoken to who loves Peter Green's playing, they, they love his sound as well. He had this beautiful, pure tone, a, a real, what I'd describe as a high headroom guitar tone. Like you didn't hear the sound of the amplifier being really overdriven heavily. And it was, it was the sound of like, you know, a, a larger amplifier. Um, you know, run at about half mast, so, so it was kind of loud and had muscle, but it wasn't particularly dirty sounding. Um, just yeah, a beautiful sound. One, probably my favourite tone, especially for a Les Paul player. Um, yeah, I, I love his guitar sound. Just a beautiful and a beautiful touch. You know, he had wonderful phrasing as a player, and um, yeah, that that kind of beautiful pure tone was was always really appealing. Always, you know, just the right amount of of reverb in his sound when he used it, when he didn't use it, it always sounded just beautiful and, and, and sweet. Um, you know, and he could play with fire and, 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 you know, a fair amount of treble, but, um, yeah, he always just seemed to be working his tone with his hands and with the controls of his guitar in, in a way that, you know, he had that out of phase sound that everyone kind of who loves his playing also knows about, but he, he worked that, you know, you can hear on these recordings where he'd maybe, you know, have it in the middle position, and have his both his volume controls set pretty low, so it was kind of very clean and thin and and out of phase. But then he'd sort of wind in his neck pickups volume, and it would get fatter and louder. And you know, he was always working that stuff through, especially on those live recordings. You can hear him working on it, working his tone with his hands and with the controls as he goes along. Very, you know, in a, in a really masterful way. What I really dig is the fact that he stuck to his guns and did what he wanted to do, regardless. Um, obviously there was, you know, I mean, he was sort of diagnosed schizophrenic and all that sort of stuff. And, um, but he was such a, um, such a confident player for such a young man. Like Clapton, you know, you can hear Clapton singing on the first Blues Breakers album and he's tentative, you know, but. Peter Green played on the one after that called A Hard Road and he gets a couple of songs on where he sings and it's like he sings great, he writes great, he writes great hooks. Like he just seemingly had had it all together and also he wasn't frightened by other guitar players as well. Like I, I read a story about how he was actually at uh, I don't know if it was Olympic Studios or wherever Hendrix was recording Third Stone from the Sun, but he was at that recording session. And um, he wasn't phased by Hendrix. He didn't feel that there was a competition there. You know, he was just so sure of himself. And um, that's the amazing thing, you know, because you hear, you hear young young men when they get into their bands and stuff like that. And then when they get old, it's like, oh, he's found his feet and he's doing his thing. But Peter Green, he, he kind of was fully formed, you know. He could do all of that stuff. Um, but, yeah, just good on him for sticking to his guns and doing what he wanted to do. And with the name, Peter Green's Fleetwood Mackie, already that forethought of going, well, you know, if I leave the band... I've left you a name, you know, you've got a name. That name, that name. Yeah, I did totally because like there aren't very many guitar players that I've sort of obsessed over their tone, but I'm totally obsessed over Peter Green's sound from the moment I heard it. And, you know, I was, I was grabbing my static Les Paul and, you know, there was an article in a guitar magazine and I, I read the article and I pulled the neck pickup out and I 
turned the magnet upside down and put it back in and then played. It was like, oh my God, there's the sound, you know? So I was, I've always been really obsessed with that sound and, you know, what amps do you use and what did he have these controls on and you get full on. Like I've been that way about Roy Buchanan, about, you know, David Gilmore and those guys, you know, they're just tone heads. And, um, like to the point of watching Peter Green's hands, like I remember the first time I actually saw footage and the thing that was amazing was like he had really beautiful hands, like really gorgeous, gorgeous hands, like really long fingers. And But just watching his touch, he didn't strangle the shit out of the guitar. He just touched everything the way it was meant to be touched you know, meant to be. Um, and so, yeah, I got totally caught up with the, the history, the provenance of the guitar, um, how it came to sound that way. Um, also, you know, then, but then it became Gary Moore's guitar and he owned it for 35 years. So he owned it longer than Peter Green had it. Peter Green had it for about eight years, you know. And I remember... I was at a gig and Chris Wilson said to me, oh, Gary Moore sold the Greeny Les Paul. I was like, what? No way. Yeah, yeah, apparently, you know, and he sort of went into the story. You know, it was like a death. I could not believe that he got rid of that guitar out of all of the fucking guitars that he had. And then he sold it and then it went to some nut, some dude at a shop and then some collector owned it and... Now Kirk Hammett has it. And, but the thing is, the guitar has a fan club of its own. Like, regardless of what you think of Kurt Hammett, like, I, I dig the fact that it's being played, you know, but it's the fact that it's being dragged around the world as a photo opportunity guitar is a bit weird, you know. Um, that guitar has has a has a bigger life than, it's a bigger legend than Kirk Hammett is, you know. Um, that's got to that's gotta tell you something, you know. I mean, it's a piece of mahogany, for Christ's sake. It's, it's maple. It's, it's, it's wood wire and strings. That's all it is. It's, you know, it's a particularly good Les Paul. But I'm sure that there's brand new Les Pauls you could find that would be tonally fantastic as well so yeah it's the dude playing it that made the magic peter green you know albatross was played on a stratocaster everyone goes oh listen to that deep tone it's a les paul no it's not he's playing a strat you know like so it's the guy driving it Really, I am, like, you know me, you know, I post things and I only post things really when I'm feeling feeling it or feeling like doing it. And everyone was sharing songs and I couldn't really find any words to actually express express it. But, you know, the best thing I could do really was show um, show uh, how he is informed my playing. And I, I just just tried to get in there and try and eke out the parts of my playing that I sort of filtered through from Peter Green. So really that's what I'm conveying is there's space, you know, um, tone and like the big reverb sound and, you know, the constant changing of tone, fiddling with your volume and uh, volume controls. You know, you can get so many different sounds if you're just committed to, um, to, to going down that rabbit hole. And so really that's, I guess it was, you know, a bit of a, bit of a thank you. And again, not wanting to do it with words, you know, like, Sometimes I would, yeah. you know, if you can just give an order, to, people will get it. 
you know, sometimes you just, it's like I could sit here and tell you why I like this album or that album, but the best thing for me to do would be to actually sit you down and play some songs and go, there, that, you know. Thank <laughs> you. 